The Senate Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. Uh, Mr. Secretary, if you could please call roll. Uh, Vice Chair Orenshaw? Here. Senator Goykachia? Here. Senator Daly? Here. Senator Krasner? Here. Chair Flores? Present. Uh, please let the record reflect all members are present. We have a quorum. Uh, welcome to the hardworking Committee on Government Affairs. I want to remind folks to please sign in if you haven't done so already, particularly those of you who will be testifying today. Uh, I also want to remind folks that you all have the opportunity to submit your testimony in writing should you wish to support any bill and or oppose or come in the neutral position. Please provide your business card to our staff. Uh, each and every single time you uh, come forward and either address an issue and or present, please state your name for the record. Uh, I want to remind folks that we are all working off of our laptops. Please do not take that as a sign of disrespect if we're looking down. Uh, we're often multitasking back here. And with that, we have four items on the agenda for today. Uh, we have a presentation by the City of North Las Vegas, followed by three bill presentations. We're going to take everything in the order it appears in the agenda. Uh, and then at the very end, we'll do public comment. I want to remind those of you wishing to join us for public comment, uh, it's not an opportunity for you to address any particular bill. You can always go to those individual hearings, but rather to discuss matters that fall within the general purview of this committee. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to invite the uh, City of North Las Vegas forward. Good afternoon. Welcome, Mayor, and whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the Hardworking Committee on Government Affairs. Thank you for having us here today. For the record, my name is Leonardo Benavides, Government Affairs Manager for the City of North Las Vegas, and it is our pleasure to talk to you today about the growth and exciting developments that are happening currently at the City of North Las Vegas. So here today at the table of the dais with me, we have our esteemed Mayor, Pamela Goins-Brown. We have our city manager, chief executive officer, Mr. Ryan Juden, or Dr. Ryan Juden. We also have our community director of community services and engagement, Seraphine Calvo. And then also, I just want to highlight some of our team that's also here today and will help us as well as if needed for the question portion. We have Michaela Moore, who is our city attorney and chief legal officer in the audience. We also have Rebecca Gibson, our assistant city manager. We also have Marisa Rodriguez, our Chief Deputy City Attorney. We also, and of course, we have our Government Affairs team with Jared Luke, our Director of Government Affairs and Economic Development. And rounding out our team is Candace Townsend, our Government Affairs Specialist. So without further ado, I will pass it to Mr. Juden. Ryan Juden for the record, City of North Las Vegas. I want to thank this committee for uh, taking the time today to listen to North Las Vegas. We're appreciative of your time and look forward to presenting this presentation. On the first slide that, that's before you, I, I love this slide because this is a slide of firsts. Um, what you see here is this is our council. Our council is made up of, of five members, um, one of being, being the mayor elected at large. But in this slide, you see the first Hispanic uh, Latino that is elected to the city of North Las Vegas and Councilman Barone. You also see the first Latina in Councilwoman Ruth Garcia Anderson. And the state's, not only the city of North Las Vegas' is first black mayor, but, this, but the state of Nevada's first black mayor and Mayor Pamela Goins Brown. On the next slide, um, we also have a municipal court in the city of North Las Vegas. Our courts changed a little over time. Um, in 2016, because of decreased workload within the court, the council decided to, to decrease the, the judges to one. That was something that was in effect for four years. And then as case, case numbers increased, we're very data-driven at the city of North Las Vegas. As those cases increased, there was a second court that was added in February of, of 2021. The next slide shows the districts of the city of North Las Vegas. We have four council districts. You can see that, that uh, Ward 1 is very large. It includes uh, some of uh, Senator Gokachia's former area, an apex industrial park that makes that a very large district, a lot of undeveloped land in that area. Um, what I want to, uh, we, after each census is when we redistrict at the city of North Las Vegas, and that redistricting and the attention that's been given to that redistricting is, has created the kind of diversity that we have within the elected leaders in North Las Vegas. If you look at this, on this slide, it has a city, the city demographics, and in 2013, you can see that the, the, 
the demographics of the city of North Las Vegas elected officials didn't necessarily represent the community. But if you look today, in, in 2023, as we sit here, the city of North Las Vegas is uh, well reflected in the elected representative that we have on council. We are the 18th most culturally diverse city in the nation, according to the census. We have a, a population growth that at, at its boon in, in year 2000 was a little over 9%. It then started to level off, and we've seen over the last 10 years a steady decline in the population increase, and now we're at 1.68 um, was the, the last population growth. As, as some of, of the committee members know, um, because they were with us in, in the city of North Las Vegas as we came before this body uh, for some of the challenges, the city of North Las Vegas in 2013 was a city in crisis. Um, this slide represents some of the different challenges that we inherited coming into the city of North Las Vegas. It was in state receivership. Um, it was something that, it was a very large financial problem that even though it was in state receivership, it was well known that the, uh, that section of the NRS didn't really contemplate the ability to deal with the kinds of challenges that North Las Vegas was facing on the financial front. That section of the law was written to actually deal with financial challenges in White Pine County School District, which were dramatically different in, in a much smaller county than the city of, of North Las Vegas and the challenges that it had. Um, the city had a highly speculative bond rating of B, which if you, if you uh, bond rating, the, it's basically set, uh, five levels below junk. So we weren't even junk bond, we were junk, 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 junk uh, by five. We had $152.6 million structural deficit which was something that impacted our ability to provide services to our residents and to continue operating as a city. Because cities don't go um, bankrupt in the traditional sense like you would see in the private sector with a business because we still have revenues that come in usually through our utility. And so cities generally go servant and solvent where they're unable to provide the kinds of services that are necessary and that are required by the residents. We had active lawsuits with all of our um, collective bargaining groups Within a few months of, of coming into the city of North Las Vegas, um, we had a, a court judgment against the city for $41 million, which there was no way that the city of North Las Vegas had the ability to fix that. And so through a lot of effort with all of our collective bargaining groups, um, there was tough decisions that were made that those uh, employees that, that live love, serve the residents of North Las Vegas, were able to come to uh, agreements that were able to keep the city floating. There was over a third of the workforce had been laid off, which created a lot of issues with deliverable uh, delivery of service, as well as just culture challenges within the city of North Las Vegas. And something I'll get to in, in a little bit is the, the use of the PILT transfer. $32 million was being used from the PILT, which represented about a third of our operating budget. I was, I was contacted in the summer of 2012 to really put together a plan on how you would save the city of North Las Vegas. And as a social scientist, it was an interesting opportunity for me. And myself and a colleague at Brookings Institute, the late uh, Rob Lang, we worked on, on thoughts of how you would be able to save the city. And this, this uh, plan that was, that, that was put together, um, it had a lot of different concepts to it. One of the concepts was, uh, that the first order of business is, is to stay in business as uh, for any business. Um, we knew that in order to really change the trajectory of North Las Vegas, we needed to assemble a team, um, a, a different team that was able to move the city in a different direction. And if you look at this, this slide, um, this, the, once again, it has the city, the demographics of the city of North Las Vegas. When I came into the city, the director level and above was 96% white male. There was not a diversity of thought, there was not a diversity of representation within that group. And through very intentional and purposeful acts, you can see today that we have a management team that's much more reflective of the diversity of the community. It's something that, that is, we're draw, we draw on constantly, the, the talent that we have to address the challenges that we have in the city of North Las Vegas. We really look at, at each department within the city of North Las Vegas as a laboratory. And I'm going to talk for a second about some of the different laboratories that we have operating within the city of North Las Vegas. This is a concept that comes from Supreme Court Justice Brandeis, who said that states are the laboratories of democracy. This was kind of an early commentary on federalism and how it operates within the United States. And this is the, the belief that federal 
level decisions can have impacts on states. And so it's best for states to try out different things. And we took that a little bit further and we believe that cities are really a great laboratory of democracy. Where we have the opportunity to try different things and those things that work can be replicated and, and they can um, be implemented in other, in other jurisdictions. And that's something that we uh, really pride ourselves on in the city of North Las Vegas. And the first kind of great uh, test, if you will, was this concept of gronomics. This was our first experiment in the laboratory uh, of North Las Vegas. And it's this concept that the city of North Las Vegas in southern Nevada has the highest taxing of, of any entity. And government can usually solve its problems when it has a revenue challenge by simply going back to the tax base and increasing taxes. But because of the tax burden that already existed in the community, we knew that wasn't an option for North Las Vegas. And we thought of the concept of maybe we could grow a tax base. Maybe we could change and reconfigure things within the city of North Las Vegas to be able to attract a new tax base, expand that tax base to, to help um, provide services for and, and, and support services for the residents of North Las Vegas and not simply go back and tax existing residents. Um, this experiment was something that uh, was the recognition that the 87% of, of Americans, their retirement savings is in their home. And we knew that if we could increase property values for residents of North Las Vegas, that we would be able to, to really change the trajectory of many people's lives. And so Gronomics was kind of mixed in with this idea of increasing property values across the valley in order to, to help our residents. We, we've talked a lot about in the city of time is money. This is something that Ben, ben Franklin talked about in the Tradesman, a great little uh, pamphlet publication that he, that he provided. And we believe that time was money for businesses. And if we could reduce the amount of time that, that businesses were moving through our processes at the city of North Las Vegas, that we could attract um, other businesses. And we saw the, the fruits of this. We had one large developer that was doing large spec buildings. We were able to work with them and talk to them about, hey, you're kind of going to be our guinea pig here, but we're going to streamline processes, make sure that when you acquire that land, that you'll be able to get going on it very quickly. And halfway through that process, that developer recognized the value of being able to move through the city bureaucracy in a, in a fast way. And they actually moved a project they were working on that was slated to happen in northern Arizona, and they moved it to North Las Vegas to become another great project. These projects resulted in um, building space for, for large Fortune 500 companies who were able to come into the city of North Las Vegas to build that tax base. Apex was something that was critical to, to North Las Vegas. We knew that in order to, to, to increase the uh, diversity of the economy within North Las Vegas and bring true economic development, that we wanted to kind of follow the lead of the state, which developed in 2011, a SRI Brookings report, which became a blueprint for the state model of what they should focus on in the economic development. And in that, they developed seven different sectors. And we took three of those sectors and we said, listen, we're going to, to align our sectors that we're going to target with the state sectors. And that way we would be kind of working together and trying to uh, attract businesses. Apex quickly became something that was very central to being able to provide future real estate for these companies to come and expand in. This slide uh, presents kind of where we are with Apex. We've come a long way um, bringing utilities to Apex and, and providing uh, this new tax base. Another area that, that, that we looked at was the downtown core in North Las Vegas. Agora is a project that's on 19 acres. It creates 900 permanent jobs, and it's over 200 million in capital investment in the downtown core of North Las Vegas. That really, for that community, provides a lift, provides an opportunity to increase valuations of their homes in that area. And we're excited about what, what that uh, project is bringing. Another area we looked at was medical and health sciences. That was an area that was designated by the state as an area for growth in the state of Nevada. And so Helios is a project that's going right by the VA hospital. The VA hospital, if you, if you, I'm not sure if it's still current, but if you go on the VA's website, they consider that hospital in North Las Vegas the jewel of their system. That's what they called it. That's what the federal government calls it. We knew that that was an asset that could be leveraged, that we could, the, the 
all the dirt around that area is something that, that creates wonderful opportunities. So we worked with Senator Reed and his team to move some of the lands bill allocation down to 130 acres adjacent to the VA hospital because we knew that was an area that we could develop. It's been a long process in doing that, but now we have a medical campus that's going up in North Las Vegas. And this is important for the residents of North Las Vegas. My wife is a fourth generation Nevadan, and she is a North Las Vegas girl. And, and we have four sons and one daughter, and none of them have been born in North Las Vegas because there's not a hospital in North Las Vegas where, with the maternity ward where you can have a child in North Las Vegas. Helios will change that. Helios provides a 600 hospital, uh, a bed hospital, creates over 12,000 jobs and represents over four and a half billion dollars in investment in North Las Vegas. We're excited about the opportunity that, that provides in leveraging um, that area that the state has identified for economic development in the future. If you look at the 10 years of Gronomics, it's an experiment that's really worked well in North Las Vegas. Um, by us doing business at the speed of business, by taking, we took permit processes in the city of North Las Vegas that would take six months, and now they're over the counter. They can be done in minutes. And that, that kind of time saving is what has brought a lot of businesses into North Las Vegas to help us build that tax base. You can see here some of the important numbers, the 63,000 new jobs that were created, the amount of investment in, in capital. We had some audacious goals. We had a goal, for example, right out of the gate that we wanted to have 100 million square feet in new concrete. We've surpassed that goal. And I, I think one of the things that is really important when you're looking at growing a tax base and whether it's successful is we actually did it. If you look at the assessed valuation in 2013 of the entire corporate, all uh, taxable assets within the city of North Las Vegas, it was 3.98 billion. Today, that's 11.11 .11 billion. And that's a 180% increase in our tax base. And what that has done is it started to bring in alignment the revenues that are coming into the city of North Las Vegas to support the services that we provide, that our, that our team members provide for the residents of North Las Vegas. I'd like to turn the time over now to Director Calvo to talk a little bit about some of the different other laboratories as we've been able to expand and solve some of the financial challenges, how now we've been able to go out into the community to serve our residents. Good afternoon. Uh Chair and committee. My name is Serafin Calvo, Director of Community Services and Engagement for the City of North Las Vegas. For the record, I am the Director of Community Services and Engagement, and uh, I'm very proud and I am, I am honored to be able to lead this department because it provides the services that our community really needs. Uh, one of the things that we focus on is to be able to engage the community and be able to have them participate in the growth and development. We oversee educational initiatives, homeless uh, services initiatives, and also the Veteran uh, Resource Center and Veteran Services. We recently opened in October 27th of 2022 a uh, Veteran Services Resource Center that has 2,000 square feet with available office space within the Resource Center uh, for service providers to provide services out of the Resource Center. There's also a uh, social gathering space and space for workshops, educational initiatives, and social gatherings. We have the ability to um, do computer training and tablets are available for the veterans and their families to access. Um, we have also partnered with several um, nonprofit and service providers that are operating out of the, this resource center on a daily basis. Um, organizations such as Salvation Army, AARP, Armed Forces Chambers, U.S. Vets, Aetna, Integrated Medicine, Goodwill and Compassion for Hospice. The Resource Center is currently open Monday through Thursday, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and soon will be open uh, Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, the other area that I'm really, really excited about is the Dolores Huerta Resource Center. The Dolores Huerta Resource Center is slated for completion in 2023, and it will be the first facility of its kind in Nevada, operated by the city of North Las Vegas, and supported by service providers from across the Las Vegas Valley providing a welcoming and inclusive one-stop shop for residents to access a wide variety of services and programs. All resources and information will be offered in both English and Spanish. 
The center will focus on serving the Hispanic Latino community while working to build connections between the diverse population represented in our great city and bringing critical services to the community. We've identified six areas um, that the programming and services will focus on. One of them is law clinics and workshops, education, technology, uh, physical and mental health and wellness, job development, and arts and culture. The community has really rallied around this project and they're very excited. We have several partners in the community, uh, service providers that have already signed up to partner with the city of North Las Vegas to make this happen. And um, very happy to have Dolores Huerta who is anxious to be here for the ribbon cutting personally. Um, this is something that is um, very important for our community that will represent them and their needs and we'll be able to help them grow and as they inform themselves of services uh, that are available. Thank you. Ryan June for the record. Um, if we have labs in the city of North Las Vegas, Serafin has a lot of labs in his department. He's kind of like a little mad scientist running around trying different things and he embodies what we really try and do in the city of North Las Vegas. Another great example of, of what we've done that's a, that's a new lab that we brought on in the city of North Las Vegas was an initiative where council really wanted us to, to be more professional in our approach to, to grants and grant writing. And we recognized that, and we felt that regardless of the presidential election outcome in, in 2020 that we would see a return of earmarks. Um, that we felt that that was something that Congress had, had given away and they were probably going to bring back. We didn't know they were going to change the name of it, but when when that happened, we were very prepared. If you look at, at F, uh, fiscal year 2019, the city of North Las Vegas had a little over $20 million in federal funding that came in. Uh, once we created and put together a, a team that targeted these things, we had a dramatic increase. You see there was $168 million in active awards. If you take out ARPA's $121 million. That's a 727% increase in federal dollars that can come in to benefit the residents of North Las Vegas. We believe that the approach that we've taken to grant writing, the approach we've taken in creating uh, that lab has been extremely successful in the city and extremely successful for the residents of North Las Vegas. The next slide kind of puts, uh, is something is interesting because sometimes the, the I don't want to say mentality, but the way in which we approach business at the city of North Las Vegas <laughs> is something that can also be transitional in nature. So when COVID hit, um, right away, there was different ideas from, from directors where the fire chief would come in and say, I think we can maybe do it this way. I think maybe we can do this. And we tried a bunch of different things. And a lot of different things were widely successful. When our IT, whenever we saw that people were going on trying to, to register to, to get the uh, vaccinations, our IT director said, you know, these things keep crashing. Maybe we need to use this alternative program that's, be, that's used uh, in professional sports during half times when there's a lot of people that jump on it all at once and it has the propensity to crash. For a little over $6,000, we were able to bring on a, a, a program that, unlike other programs that cost millions of dollars and were later scrapped by governments, ours was not very expensive and it never crashed. And we were able to, if you see the vaccination numbers, over 100,000 doses that were provided to our residents. And this was something that's important because we have communities in the city of North Las Vegas that because of healthcare outcomes over years were dramatically impacted more by COVID than any other community. And we knew that that's something that we needed to address. Another thing that, that, was, that was interesting during this time is if you recall all governments, uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, were making these decisions of whether, what they do, who's essential, who's non-essential. What do they do with the non-essential? What do they do with the essential? We made the determination early on um, that declaration, the national declaration was on Friday the 13th. Anytime there's a national declaration on Friday the 13th, buckle up. And then we then um, declared a, a, a city emergency on the following Monday, or that Sunday evening, sorry. Then on Monday, we met together with our team and said, listen, in this conversation of who's essential and who's non-essential, all government employees are essential. Just the functions that they did pre-pandemic not, might not be essential during a pandemic. So we worked very closely with our bargaining groups to move people into areas where we could provide services to residents. So for example, on Tuesday, after the, the, the Tuesday after the uh, pandemic had been declared, I was over at Three Square with 
uh, members of our library team, with members of our parking enforcement crew, because we're not going to be handing out parking tickets during a pandemic. And we were packing lunches for students that we knew that, that their um, ability to receive food was, especially those that are food insecure, was being disrupted when schools closed. These, these same employees later on, as we constantly, if you all recall, we constantly had different mandates that were changing from CDC, from the federal level, and as those things were changing, we were then able to multi-purpose uh, multi employees where every business license in the city of North Las Vegas received multiple calls from our employees because we understood the importance of these businesses. We had worked so hard to grow a tax base, the last thing we wanted to do was start losing our, our our revenue supporters, people that were providing the resources to the city. So we would contact them, we would work with them, make sure they had the signage, we would take signage out to them, make sure they understood the mandates, whatever is necessary to keep them going and keep them in business. That's just an example of something that we were able to do um, during the, the, the COVID response. The next slides are the budget of North Las Vegas. I'll leave those in case there's some specific questions, but they're um, very similar to our other jurisdictions. And then finally, I just want to call attention to the role that this body has played in helping this success story with the city of North Las Vegas. In a Dillon rural state, obviously, we're limited in what we can do in many ways. And in, 2017, in 2011, the uh, legislature rightfully was concerned with how North Las Vegas was, was doing their pill transfer. Basically, what was happening is the city of North Las Vegas was charging residents for utility services, sewer and water. And then they would take the, the, the leftover revenues, because some of it we have to pay SNWA because we purchase water from them. Instead of taking those and putting those into an enterprise fund for the day that pipes fail, they were taking those dollars and they were flowing them into the general fund to support other services throughout the city. And that's a challenge. That's a problem. I think this body rightfully understood it and said, North Las Vegas, you can't charge people for sewer and water. Then use the proceeds to pay for police, fire, and libraries. That's not the honest way that you do business with the public. And so in 2011, the legislature said you need to stop that, and they gave the city of North Las Vegas 10 years to stop the practice. When we came in and started getting our arms around the challenges in the city of North Las Vegas, we knew that 10 years was not something that we could reasonably do. And the problem was, is all the bond analysts, one of the reasons we had such a crummy um, uh, municipal bond rating was because of what they called a fiscal cliff. Everyone on Wall Street knew that the city of North Las Vegas was using about $32 million a year from the utility fund to fund general fund operations. And they knew that if North Las Vegas had to stop that, cold turkey in 2021, how would you fill the hole? And they called it the fiscal cliff. It was throughout the bond analyst reports on Wall Street that that was a fiscal cliff we had to answer. So we came back to the legislature in 2017 and I think had a very elegant solution that we worked with this body on. Commissioner Kirkpatrick then uh, had just been a new commissioner. She was actually key in, in working through this because she was chair of government affairs in the assembly and our mayor at the time, John Lee, was chair of government affairs in the Senate whenever they had um, written this bill in 2011. That bill at, 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 at the time, um, I testified to the legislature and I said that allowing the city to take advantage of lower bond rates to refinance and reduce necessary interest payments and return tax dollars back into the community. We knew that if we could change that through the help of the legislature that we would see a, a direct and dramatic increase in our bond rating and we did. We're now our investment grade. We were able to go in and refinance those uh, junk bonds if you will and the interest payments alone to the residents of North Las Vegas is over $70 million that would have just gone to Wall Street to pay interest. That money we were able to put back into programming. And the council didn't start there. Or didn't, they didn't stop there. They decided that since we no longer are, and we are reducing our reliance on PILT per the legislation, that there was things that we could do to, to return that so all boats rise with residents. And the city of North Las Vegas took a very unusual action, and they actually cut dramatically the sewer rates for all residents of North Las Vegas. We were the highest sewer, had the highest sewer rates in the valley, and were able to return some of those dollars during the pandemic back to the community at a time that, that it was needed. So in every sense of the term, uh, the term North Las Vegas is, is truly a turnaround town. Um, today our, our bond rating is investment grade by all agencies. 
Last week was kind of a hallmark week for the city of North Las Vegas because our libraries for the first time since the recession opened back up to normal business hours. It's been a slow process, it's been a deliberative process, but it's been a very successful process in the city of North Las Vegas. And we're proud of the different things that we've done. S&P and Moody's did a very unusual thing and they brought in bond analysts from Wall Street and Chicago to visit with our team to try and identify how were we able to do what we did. And we worked and we talked to them about it and then they asked us to meet with some of their other, other clients. And we've met with counties and cities in California, we've met with cities as far away as Japan and Peru to explain what we were able to do and how they could learn from, from lessons and how they could replicate it in their jurisdictions. So I'm, I'm very proud of the team, the tremendous team and the work that's been done in the city of North Las Vegas to bring it to this point where we, we still have a lot that we're working on, but that we've really um, made major strides in the city of North Las Vegas. And I'll now turn the time over to our mayor. Thank you, Mr. City Manager, and good afternoon. My name is Pamela Goins Brown, mayor of North Las Vegas. Thank you, chair and members of the committee. I'd just like to provide some closing statements if I may. As I grew up, I watched North Las Vegas grow up alongside me. I remember when it was referred to as Northtown, when cops was filmed there, and it did not have the best reputation. Sure, North Las Vegas has its struggles, but as has been presented here today, it is clearly evident that North Las Vegas has grown into a truly diverse and thriving community, much different than the North Las Vegas of the past. When the city was faced with state receivership, I stood up for my community. I stayed up late trying to find solutions. I got my hands dirty and helped save and turn it into what you see here today as our city manager presented. We saved the city. And now the residents have spoken and elected me the first African-American mayor in Nevada history. Since 2013 to 2022, chapter one has been written. And now North Las Vegas gets to write chapter two so that our story continues to be told and future chapters will be written. I look forward to working with you, the state, which will require communication as we support each other and we support our diversity. In this last year and a half, as I traveled along the campaign trail, I met wonderful, hardworking residents on their doorsteps and in public forums. I was so happy to hear that residents approved of the direction the city is leading and heading, and I promised them, and today, and I promised them still, that this committee and I, and I and my staff, will govern responsibly to continue making North Las Vegas the safe, prosperous and beautiful city that it is. So I appreciate your time. That concludes our presentation and we will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you again. And thank you for the presentation today. Obviously there's a lot to cover and you have to try to reduce that to a very small uh, 10 minute presentation. So again, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with your team up here. Um, and I look forward to continuing that relationship. Members, any questions? And I know we have a couple. Senator Gokachir, are we good? Uh, we'll start off with the Vice Chair, please. Thank you very much, Chair and uh, Mayor and all the officials from North Las Vegas. Thank you for being here. And uh, uh, really an honor to have you here in your historic election. And I grew up in Southern Nevada, too, and got to meet your father when I was a young kid and I always had tremendous respect for him and remember a treat when I was a kid was going up to uh, Wimpy's up in North Las Vegas which doesn't exist anymore I think the sign's still there the old Wimpy's but we always had fond memories of that we didn't I didn't grow up in North Las Vegas of going up there um, well, a couple of questions I had um, from some of the slides in terms of some of the federal funds that were sent to North Las Vegas one question I have, if the chair will indulge me with two questions. First question, as to the federal funds that have been provided in the last several years, um, have those all been allocated and spent or some still waiting to be spent? And then there was a slide that discussed the, the PILT, the payment in lieu of taxes, and I'm wondering how much has been paid back on that and how much is still waiting to be paid back. And, and if you don't have the info now, you have to get it offline, but I sure appreciate trying to address those either here or offline. Thank you. 
Sure, so in regards to federal funds, I can get you the specifics on the numbers, but what I can tell you is the philosophy that council had in, in appropriating those funds is if you, if you recall, uh, CARES was the first kind of allocation that came from the federal government. Treasury guidance gave guidance on how those dollars should be, should be allocated to, to the different jurisdictions. Um, North Las Vegas, in true form, we had to fight for our allocation of federal dollars. We had to, to, to uh, let's say we had to work um, aggressively with individuals to make sure that they interpreted the Treasury guidance and guidelines that were provided by, by the federal government the same way that every other state in the country did. And so with those dollars, I think what's really important is how those were spent. So over 75% of the dollars that came in to the city of North Las Vegas in the form of CARES dollars went directly back into the community. They were not used to, uh, you know, to build buildings or, or uh, you know, redo our, our lobby in the city hall. They weren't used for um, employees, for bonuses or things like that. As we recognized a principle that um, after the pandemic was over, we believed and we still believe that there's a fiscal challenge that's going to continue to happen. And once you have the health concerns that are abated, you have the fiscal concerns that come next. And we were going to need our businesses to be healthy and to stay in business. So we allocated those dollars to them. We currently, I can give you uh, what we're doing with ARPA dollars. There were different buckets that were designed per the law. Um, and I think we've been very aggressive in making sure those dollars go into a lot into nonprofits that are providing social, social programs that we don't provide at the city of North Las Vegas. And so we'll get you some more information on that, on the specific money amounts and allocations. In regards to PILT, you know, one of the challenges with PILT was the, the cold turkey approach that we were faced that was going to happen in 2021. So the, the legislation that moved in 2017 provided a 30-year period where we could move off of the PILT reliance, which required a 3% reduction every year. So we've gone from a, a height of PILT use of $32 million to in this budget that's going to be going to council uh, for their um, review and approval in, in uh, next month, it's a little over $19 million of what currently um, PILT is being used in the general fund. We could, um, in many ways, and this is something that a conversation we have often with employees and with employee groups, is just recognizing that we still have this transfer that's happening. But what it did is it allowed North Las Vegas to kind of have that lift. We think of it as like an airplane that's got these mountains out there. Before the airplane was like this, and here's the mountains really close, and we weren't going to have the lift that was necessary to clear those mountains. By the legislature moving it out 30 years, we knew that we would provide that, be able to provide that lift. And so I, I believe that uh, management and council's approach is a strong approach that recognizes the need to remove the reliance on PILT, but at the same time do it in a responsible way so we can increase services to residents back back to some, some, of, some of the pre-recession levels. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that and uh, look forward to anything else you can provide yes, me and the committee. Thank you, Chair. Senator Daly, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a, a general question. Uh, I was just looking up, and I see that uh, you guys have a new, brand new charter committee uh, added to the charter in 2021. I wasn't here, but I spent a lot of time looking at the charter, everybody that comes. And Las Vegas is going to sometime, and they'll get a charter committee there, too, um, just if they're listening. Um, so can you... Give me a rundown on how it went. Obviously, it went into effect 2021, so this would be the first session where they could have met. How many meetings did they have? What staff was given to them? Were there any recommendations? So I want to make sure that it's working properly. It can be a very good tool. Uh, I know a couple of years ago, City of Reno hadn't had anyone look at their charter for 20 years. So when they came here, they got a charter committee, and it's been working well uh, ever since. Uh, uh, so I just wanted, if you can give me a rundown on how many meetings did they have, did everyone get appointed, what staff uh, was allocated to make sure that they operated, and, um, and any recommendations and what the process was and their recommendations. Yeah, I appreciate that that question, Ryan June, for the record. Um, you know, when the, the, whenever we brought a charter bill uh, to the legislative body last year, or, or last session, there was a conversation with the charter committee. And, and it's, it's funny you mentioned Reno, because I, I remember some conversations from some of the other jurisdictions, like, oh, a charter committee, you don't want a charter committee, and wait till Assemblyman Daly hears about a charter, like, he's the charter committee guy. And there was a lot of concern on it. And, and I even said, guys, if we don't want to do a charter committee, 
But then I don't know if it was you or one of your colleagues that made a statement that really resonated with me. And that is, is a 120 day session is not really the appropriate place to have conversations about, uh, you know, large conversations about fundamental changes that would happen to a city. And I, I, that really we took to heart and thought, you know, the charter committee makes sense. So I will say to you that the charter committee is something that we're, we're digging in on as, as, you know, novices in that area. Um, we, we felt that, I don't know if we felt, but the, the charter committee was something that we did. They had one meeting because there was one charter uh, concept that the, the uh, council directed staff to look at. And so the, the charter committee was impaneled. Um, all of the appointments were made by both, um, by, by both this legislative body as well as by, by council. And they met. I, I think that um, feedback the next day, it was either the next day or the following day, where I heard, like, how'd it go? You know, or the people, there was some conversation in staff about it. Um, and I asked the question, like, well, did we have, you know, like you just said, did someone go line by line through the charter? And did the committee, you know, was there work sessions? Like, what, did we just drop something on them? So I think we recognize, um, the, because there are, I think the charter's a fi final kind of area where I believe that there's some wings that need to be spread in the city of North Las Vegas to really look at a document that's, that's, um, that's been around for a while and see of, of what are some changes that can be made in the governance side. So I can tell you that uh, during the, the interim between sessions, uh, we, in, we intend to bring that committee back. It's, it's now, um, there's major changes to the appointments of that committee because two appointments are made by the mayor, the, the, the former mayor, um, two are made by the former mayor pro tem. That, so we'll make some changes there. I think there might be some legislative ones that we have to come back for you for appointments on. But we intend to, to really, maybe in the more true vision of how you view a charter committee, is bringing them together to really go over the over the charter. But there weren't any other ideas that were brought by uh, by members of, of this body or by council or any other people to for the charter committee to consider at, at the time. So they only had that one meeting. But I think they're going to be a lot more active. And uh, th thank you. And I, I just wanted to get the rundown. It is uh, kind of a new thing. And you're right. I am interested in charter uh, committee and making sure. You know, I served on the Charter Committee in Sparks, was appointed by two different legislators uh, previously. Um, and, you know, like I say, a lot of times, so the Charter Committee is meant to be a little more independent, not just receiving information from right. staff and various things. Uh, generally, what uh, we would do when, when we had that, you know, you'd form, you'd have your first meeting, um, you do the formation regular stuff, and then you would ask the members, typically the chair would say, if you've got any items in the charter that you want to discuss and bring up, so the charter committee panelists, people, can bring their issues forward. Some of it they're going to get from the city. City's free to say, hey, these are the issues we've identified, and then they, they go through and, and make that. And I know it's structured. I was just looking at it a little bit ago. Um, to be a little bit autonomous, I understand there's more, and by design, there's more appointees from the city than there is from the legislative side of it. Same thing with Reno and the rest of them, because uh, we're not trying to outweigh you or anything like that. Um, but I think if you let them do their stuff, review it, uh, you'll find that it, uh, it works pretty well. And they'll come with their recommendations uh, which are just recommendations. They got to go to a legislator and get a bill, um, but it doesn't require approval. Uh, and I'll give one example. And for instance, in the city of Sparks, the salaries are set by the uh, city or by the charter in the charter, and there's not any city council member in Sparks, at least when I was there, that was going to vote to give themselves a right. raise. So it had to go through the charter committee, uh, and they were not going to vote. Yeah, I support what you guys are doing. They would just accept the recommendation and move on. Um, and they must have rubbed off to other legislators because I was not here in 2021. <laughs> uh, but they, they learned and listened, right? <laughs> Ryan, Jude, for the record, just one quick comment on that. It's, it's funny because, um, and, and I would like to meet with you offline to discuss some of your experiences on the Charter Committee and how we can make our Charter Committee more responsive. I, and I completely agree with the independence, the thoughts of the fact that, that residents can be impaneled and the ideas that they can have can be things that are fundamental and changing to, to North Las Vegas. After we ran, after we talked with them about our concept, and they were like, "No, we don't really like that," 
um, the comments made like, well, we could still do as a BDR. And knowing that you were in the Senate, I said, are you guys crazy? Like, this is not an optional committee. If we go up there to the legislature with something that wasn't vetted through the Charter Committee, I think I'm pretty sure where Senator Daley's going to be on this because it's not the first, first trial run of the Charter Committee is not something that's going to be just optional because then forever it becomes an optional committee. And if I Please. can follow up, we, we are going to ask that question, at least I am. Yeah. Did he go through the Charter Committee? Now that doesn't mean everything, but yeah. in the end it's an important part of the process. So thank you. Senator Chair, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, I was in this body before 11, and I have to say, Charter Committee or otherwise, where you've come from, what you've accomplished, uh, we tip our hat to you. I, North Las Vegas, you've done a great job. I, I know what you were facing in 2011 and what we were looking at, uh, also the changes in 2017. So, again, I tip my hat to North Las Vegas. You did a great job. You were in trouble. Thank you. Uh, and I think we have a follow-up here by our vice chair, please. Thank you, chair. Oh. No, that's fine. Please, please. Oh, my question has to do with, you know, a lot of us from Clark County have been so impressed by what's happened up here with Tahoe Regional Industrial Complex. I know that the city of North Las Vegas and the state were hoping that Apex might be an engine of technology and industry similar to what's happened up here in northern Nevada. And I just wondered if you could update us on kind of where things are at in terms of the infrastructure and, and industry possibly coming in and into the, the Apex site. Thank you. No, thank you. That's a great question. Ryan June, for the record. You know, Apex is a long play. It's 18,000 acres. It's an awful, it's not like, uh, you know, up here, Trick is a hundred and something thousand. It's, it's massive. Um, one of the first things that we needed to do in the city of North Las Vegas is you have land that was undeveloped before you even got to Apex around the Speedway. And the challenge with the Speedway land is you had city water going through there, but you had county sewer. And county doesn't like to flush our water down their sewer. So it created a real challenge for development in that area. So we worked with um, Congresswoman Titus's office in getting a, a grant through the federal government that allowed us to build the Northeast Interceptor. And within months of the Northeast Interceptor being built, all the land within that Speedway area, actually not all, about 98% of the land within that area was in some form of development. That now has developed where we've got massive, uh, if you've driven through, you know, through North Las Vegas, you can see all the development that's happening there around the Speedway. What that then, then did is started shifting focus over to Apex. Now, Apex was something that from, from the top to the bottom, the growth was usually going to happen in the southern portion closest to the utilities and start moving up. And that's something that we knew and that's something that we've seen. So Miner's Mesa, which is the first chunk of southern Apex, is now, uh, it's, there's a ton of development that's happening there um, with large Fortune 500 companies, Crocs, uh, Ball, uh, Kroger. And as we see that development happen, it's happening at the, the proper pace because we're able to now bring, we have water line that's, that's in design, design and engineering through SNWA that's bringing water all the way up to the top portion of Apex up by uh, inter Highway 93. And Apex is still the future of the valley. Apex has the ability to, hold, to host over 116,000 jobs. Those aren't jobs that are gonna be absorbed in North Las Vegas alone. The economic impact for the region is over $200 billion in direct and indirect impact that that could provide to the region. So I think now what becomes the, the issue with water and other things that are challenges in Southern Nevada is we make sure that we, the, we bring the right businesses and the right um, mix of businesses into that area. But Apex is, is going full speed ahead. It's, it's moving faster than, than I think what we, we thought it, it really could, and we're excited about what Apex brings to the region. Thank you, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, Chair. I'm gonna get Senator Krasner, and then we'll come right back to you. Senator Krasner, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to say thank you so much for your presentation and congratulations to uh, Mayor Pamela Goins Brown on being the first African American mayor in the state of Nevada. Wonderful. Senator Goykachia, please. Thank you. Real quick one, and uh, my colleague there, the vice chair, kind of, you've got a ton of solar going in in Apex, especially on the, the side there. Is that short term or? Again, how do you develop it when, I, I don't know, you've got to have close to a section of solar panels or more there. So the solar panels that you see going in there are actually on the county side. And so a lot of that, there's actually the BLM's designated a corridor through there for solar. 
And so that's what you essentially see going in there. That's, um, and there is some on the other side of, uh, uh, it's not Solo Mountain, but it's the mountain that's kind of adjacent to it that is in North Las Vegas. Um, and that's the, that's the primary solar that we have. But the majority of what you see out there, when you, you see it glistening, that's not in North Las Vegas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And in, in the interest of time, I, I wanted to ask a couple of things, but maybe I'll, I'll ask one thing and then make a request for some information to be shared with the committee. So I'll start with the request. I know um, I've had an opportunity to have a lot of meaningful conversations with colleagues in this building, and um, there's always interest uh, or any, anything involving your city. Um, and I, I know one of the conversations that's come up a couple of times uh, is regarding law enforcement, ret retention, um, specifically what are the outreach mechanisms in place, how are we bringing folk in. And then uh, lastly, just uh, what that culture is like, right? And that's probably a more difficult question because it's not a data-driven question. It's really what's happening culturally within, but, but I know folk are interested in that. And maybe, but at, at a minimum, the data-driven questions, just to, you, know, how, you know, how are we actively engaging folk to come in and create that pipeline? Um, and then retention, how, how long are folk lasting? Uh, you know, I think it will feed into that narrative and culture. I know there's bills out there, and I don't, I don't want to open up a hearing on that, but I, but I am interested in getting that for the members. Um, me personally, I just think I'm interested in engaging a little bit in, on affordable housing. It's a topic that every single jurisdiction is in one way or another engaged in. Um, so I'm interested, uh, you know, what, what are the relationships like with builders now when they're trying to come to the city of North Las Vegas? Uh, we know that when we address affordable housing issues, developers very often don't even know how to engage in that space. It's very complex. It, the math doesn't always pencil out. And even when it does, um, you know, we have a small business. Y you start thinking what makes the most sense financially. And uh, sometimes for a developer, just simply saying affordable housing doesn't always make sense. Uh, so I'm curious to know what that relationship is like with the city. Are we working with certain folk? Typically that space is small. It's typically the same players. Mm -hmm. um, are we actively engaging other players to bring them into that space, walk them methodically through that education? Um, and then uh, in addition to that, uh, what, what are the plans moving forward? Right? So we, we know that there is a conversation to be had about how do we bring developers into this space. But then in addition to that, what's, what's the five-year plan, the three-year plan, what's the tomorrow plan? If we could engage in a little bit in that affordable housing combo, please, whoever wishes to take that on. I'll, I'll take a, a piece of it. Um, so just so I understand, on the, the police information, that's something that we can, we can provide okay. offline. But I can tell you as city manager, there's some things that I can control directly. And so one of the things is I have basically six people in the command staff in, in the police department. Um, when I came in as city manager, that profile was, was very what you'd expect. It was white male. Currently in that, um, I, was, I uh, appointed the first female police chief in the history of North Las Vegas. I, I then, her successor, I appointed the first uh, female African-American police chief in the city of North Las Vegas. And today that command staff is made up of, of two African-Americans, two Latinos, and two whites. So that those are those are things that I can directly address when it comes to to just really quickly a, a little point I'll make on on recruiting and retention is you know I, I unlike the mayor I didn't stay in Holiday Inn last night right you know those old commercials from Holiday Inn right like well I'm a, I stayed in Holiday Inn last night like I'm a pro professional we had uh, post certified police officers that were working in recruiting and while it's necessary to have those because they can actually answer a lot of the questions for recruits, one of the changes we made a few months ago is we brought in a professional recruiter. Um, that was something I think is fundamental to really looking at recruiting. Uh, it's something that's challenging everybody uh, in every jurisdiction across the nation, both recruiting and retention. I believe that now we have a culture, and whenever you're, uh, many of your former colleague was Tom Roberts. Um, we contracted with Tom Roberts to make an assessment of the police department. He, come, he came up with 47 different changes that need to be made in the police department. So our former police chief, she made a ton of those changes. And change isn't an easy thing. And it, just, it was disruptive to the culture within the police department. I feel we're in a much better place within the culture of the police department. In regards to affordable housing, it's a real challenge. One of the things that we've really looked at in the city of North Las Vegas is some of the, the, the root causes of affordable housing. 
and something that we, we've talked a little bit about, it's never really been uh, wi widely received, is I believe that there is a there is probably a, a proportionality to the number of hotel rooms a jurisdiction has or a region has in the number of short-term rentals that a region has. Because a short-term rental is just a small private sector way to get into that space of, of almost into the, 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 the hotel space, if you will. When you look at our affordable housing units that exist in the city of North Las Vegas, once those come, come online, many of them are gobbled up by short-term rentals. And what that does is it creates a, a, a supply-demand challenge within that space. And so I, I, I believe that affordable housing, our ability to track affordable housing, our ability to understand how um, uh, these short-term rentals are impacting affordable housing, because there are people that can buy homes in North Las Vegas, and by renting it out at a couple key weekends um, during the year, they can cover the nut of their mortgage. That's just a reality, uh, because they can rent those at such high amounts. And that is a, that is a, uh, a, it's sapping our available affordable housing, which creates the crunch within the other affordable housing. It's just the simple supply demand that we, we all learned in like Econ 101. So that's one of the things that we look at in the city of North Las Vegas. We also believe that city of North Las Vegas is, has been a significant um, contributor to affordable housing within the region. North Las Vegas has always provided more affordable housing in other areas of the region. And that's something that, that um, we have worked some with some of the developers and some of the, the funds that were provided at the state level in order to, to bring affordable housing in. We've, we've looked at regional type things, such as what the Blind Center is doing for affordable housing for their clients. And we believe that that, that kind of, uh, kind of like what you said, it's just a, a very, uh, well, you can say this, but it's, it's a very um, surgical approach to affordable housing. And we, we uh, it's the, the belief of our city attorney's office that we're limited in what we can do in the affordable housing space. I know that that's a conversation and a debate that, that that's probably going to happen this session, but that there's, there's limitations in that area. And you have to understand that anytime we... Uh, advise our policymakers on things similar to what LC, LCB does with you guys is we have to recognize that for every one side there's another side and everybody's got attorneys and we we have a duty to protect the residents of North Las Vegas and going out and leaning into um, areas where uh, our city attorney believes that they're within the state domain what was has always been a challenge for us in really getting aggressive on any kind of affordable housing policies And thank you for that. Uh, obviously, the affordable housing conversation is ongoing in, in this building, and there is an expectation by Nevada residents that we walk out of this legislative session with some, you know, at a minimum, one or two, three pieces of legislation addressing some of the, the, the situations that our <laughs> Nevadans are going through. And you all will be a partner in, in that, so I appreciate it. Uh, I know our vice chair has a uh, follow-up question, please. Thank you, chair. And actually, if you'll indulge me, a couple of follow-up questions based on your last response. I appreciate the diversity of the leadership of the North Las Vegas Police Department that you just mentioned. Do you know in terms of the rank and file officers, do demographics kind of match the demographics of the city of North Las Vegas? If you don't have that info now, I'm happy to get it offline. That's my first question. My second question, following up on chair's affordable housing question, do you know how many or any idea how many units of affordable housing are needed in North Las Vegas to try to meet the demand and what kind of projects are, are going on now. I know, and I apologize for my ignorance, I know that around the valley in southern Nevada, I see Nevada Hand building some projects, and I don't know if they're the only one working on those, but, I, and, but I'm not familiar with what's going on in, in the city of North Las Vegas, and I just wondered if, if you have that info now. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, we can provide you the info on uh, so that we, I get it specifically right in regards to the number of units, the number of, of needed units. Leo's uh, taking notes. Um, as far as diversity within rank and file of, of the police department, we are seeing major strides. The presentation that we largely provided today is kind of, it's a decade. So if you look over that decade period, in, in 2013, 23% of our, of our uh, officer force was, were uh, members of, were either African American or Latino. Today, that number's climbed to 37%. So we are seeing major strides that are being made in that, that area, and really it's being made in a very intentional and purposeful way by specifically recognizing the need to make sure that we have uh, officers that, that represent the, the community that they serve. Because let's face it, when you have challenges in communities across the country, it's not because something went wrong in public works. 
or something went wrong in utilities. That's not the reason that we have challenges. We have challenges because of those that are, that are closest to, to the people that have the ability to restrict freedoms and liberties. And so we've taken a very serious and a, a direct approach to it. Currently with, the, with our command staff, our number one and number two in the department are both African Americans. And this is something that they are very much leaning into and very much recognize the need through both pipelines and mentoring programs within the department to, to address that concern. But there has been great progress that's being made. Thank, thank you, I appreciate everything the city's doing. Thank you, Chair, for the indulgence. And I'd like to very quickly like to acknowledge uh, Assemblyman De Silva, who's joining us, uh, who's also a teacher, and I know a lot of his students are residents of your city, so I just wanted to acknowledge him in the room. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for the presentation. I appreciate you all being here today, and I look forward to continuing working with Jared, Leo, and Candace. Uh, you all have a good team up here working hard, and um, there'll be some stuff we might disagree on, but, I, but we're working in the right direction, which is taking care of Nevadans. I think we, we're, we're all on the same page. I also want to acknowledge your counsel, Marissa Rodriguez, who I have a relationship with, a good friend, um, and you got some good folk there. Um, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and close out the presentation again. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we're going to now move on to the agenda. And uh, I know we have Mr. Warren Hardy here. We, we, ha we have committed to keeping Senate Bill 115 to five minutes. And, and uh, Mr. Warren Hardy said that if, if he doesn't fulfill that, the bill dies. <laughs> so... Uh, that's a huge commitment he made, and, and I think he's going to be able to live up to it. Um, so with that, I'd like to open up the hearing on Senate Bill 115. Thank you, Mr. Ready. Chairman. You know it takes me five minutes to state the nature of the weather, but I will do my best. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, willingness to help us with this, uh, this issue. You always hesitate to say this is an easy, simple cleanup bill, but I think in this case it, it really is. I have Steve Parrish with me, who is the general manager of the Clark County Regional Flood Control District in Las Vegas, to, to touch on the program uh, a little bit so you understand why this program is so important. I hope he's not subject to the five-minute rule. Um, SB 115 became necessary to bring Nevada into uh, alignment with what the federal government is doing, specifically the EPA and the, and the, uh, the Federal Corps of Engineers. Um, in the, in the 90s, the Corps of Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States created a concept called um, mitigation banks where uh, folks like the regional flood condition who without, you know, unfortunately have to disrupt sometimes sensitive wetlands and other things because we don't get to control where floods go. And so the program that was designed in, in the early 90s was to self offset the, the damage to the to the wetlands by using funds through the mitigation bank to create and and repair and 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 and, and develop uh, uh, wetlands elsewhere. That was a pretty good program. Uh, we participated in it. The legislature in 1999 authorized the creation of these mitigation banks in Nevada. The the, the um, uh, Clark County Regional Flood Contr uh, Control District did just that and created one of these banks. Um, recently, the EPA and the Corps of Engineers has found a better way to build a mousetrap. And so they created what is called the in-lieu fee program. It's exactly, essentially the same thing as the mitigation bank program with a couple of upgrades and advantages. The most significant being in the mitigation bank program, those, uh, the administration and the funds are administered through, the, uh, through pri uh, pri private, you know, for-profit entities. Under the, under the uh, fee in, in lieu program, uh, the opportunity for nonprofits to administer those, including, I always call it the fee in lieu, it's the in lieu fee program. Um, it, it allows those, to, those, those funds and those programs to be administered with nonprofits and specifically with local governments. So that's a significant upgrade. It's also a little bit more fluid in terms of our ability to respond to these issues. So that's what SB 115 does. It updates Nevada's statute to allow us to, to implement the new and improved better program that's been adopted by the EPA and the Corps of Engineers relative to these mitigation programs. Um, we do have one, we do 
have one amendment which has been provided to the committee. It is uh, not a substantive amendment except in, in terms of the fact that in, in the original draft we neglected, we admitted some of the federal references that needed to be included. So the amendment that is before you updates that. Um, and if it pleases the chair, I'd like to turn it over to Steve for just a couple of minutes to kind of explain the, the necessity and why these programs are so important to us maintaining our responsibility as, as stewards of the environment. And then we'll be happy to answer any questions. That was four minutes and 27 seconds. <laughs> And we'll go to Las Vegas whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, for the record, my name is Stephen Parrish, General Manager and Chief Engineer of the Clark County Regional Flood Control District. Uh, we are located here in Las Vegas. Also with me is uh, Dr. Uh, John Tennert, who is our Environmental Mitigation Manager at the Regional Flood Control District. I really want to thank uh, you, uh, Chair Flores, for sponsoring this bill and helping us get it, uh, the bill to the committee and to this hearing today. I'd also like to thank uh, Chair Orenshaw, uh, Vice Chair Orenshaw and the members of the committee for allowing me to, to speak today. Uh, Mr. Hardy uh, covered it pretty well. I'm going to just touch on a few things, but um, essentially existing law, uh, Nevada state law currently authorizes the establishment and management of a wetlands mitigation bank. Um, these banks are large scale mitigation sites that are approved by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency in accordance with the Federal Clean Water Act. Um, if it's determined that a project, such as a flood control project in our world, uh, we do flood control channels within uh, the city of Las Vegas and other parts of Clark County. Um, if it's determined that those facilities or other facilities, it could be a residential subdivision or a commercial uh, development, uh, if it's determined that it's impacting an area that's uh, jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act, we're required to mitigate for any impacts to those uh, protected waters. And so we do that through the purchase, one way of doing it is through the purchase of credits uh, from the Wetlands Mitigation Bank. Um, the bank then uses the sale of these credits and they use those resources that they collect through the sale of the credits to complete the restoration, rehabilitation, and creation of wetlands in other parts of the watershed as defined in the agreement for the mitigation bank. So this bill really has two main objectives. The first is to allow in addition to the Wetlands Mitigation Bank, as Mr. Hardy mentioned, uh, an in-lieu fee type of mitigation. Um, this in-lieu fee uh, program is, when it's established, it's identical essentially to how a Wetlands Bank, Mitigation Bank uh, is process is established as, uh, through the federal government. Um, however, there uh, are a couple differences between the two programs. The first is that um, the, the Wetlands Mitigation Bank is operated on by a for-profit company, so an organization, a business, who's in the business of establishing these wetland uh, mitigation banks and managing them. They use part of the, the funds that they receive as profit to that company, and that's how that's their business operation. That's how they run their business. Um, the in lieu fee program, as Mr. Hardy mentioned, is actually run by a nonprofit or a local government agency. So in our case, we're trying to set up an in lieu fee program here in Southern Nevada. We're going to ask, uh, and we are working with uh, Clark County, uh, the Department of Environment and Sustainability is going to help us manage or actually manage this uh, program for us. Um, the other difference is and uh, the in-lieu fee programs are, are really authorized to sell advanced credits uh, for the mitigation. So for in our case, for example, if we know on our five-year plan, we have uh, channels that will be built over the next five years that may impact uh, protected waters. We can purchase credits in advance through the in-lieu fee program and know that we have the mitigation in place to deal with any impacts to the protected waters uh, once those projects uh, become, uh, you know, we start working on the design and construction of those projects. Um, and also, as uh, uh, Mr. Hardy mentioned, the, the, another objective of this bill is to uh, update the references to the federal regulations uh, that govern the establishment of the mitigation uh, program. So, um, in conclusion, really both of these uh, programs are, are acceptable to the core and to the EPA for mitigation of impacts to waters of the United States. 
Uh, we've done mitigation banks here in the southern or southern Nevada area, and it's worked really well. It's worked well across the country, and so um, in fact, the core encourages us to use mitigation banks as the mitigation uh, effort on our projects. So, with that, I would ask that you support this legislation, and I look forward to, to any questions that you may have. Thank you again. And thank you both for the presentation. We'll start off with Senator Goykachia, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yeah, Mr. Hardy, I, I just need a little clarification. All right, these mitigation areas that you're using then to to bank or to cover the in lieu, do they have to be in that jurisdiction, or can they be out in an adjacent county? I've exhausted the uh, limits of my knowledge on this. So if it pleases the chair, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Parrish or John uh, address that. I want to make sure we get it right. Yes, you're required to have the mitigation bank area within the watershed. If I could just have you state your name for the record, please. I apologize for oh, interrupting. I'm, I'm sorry. For the record, Stephen Parrish. Uh, you, you're required to have uh, uh, the mitigation area, the area that they're restoring or creating uh, wetlands, has to be within the watershed area of where the project is that you're mitigating. It's just within the watershed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, we have Vice Chair, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And I think uh, my question for Mr. Parrish down in Southern Nevada, thanks for presenting the bill. Thank you, Senator Hardy. If this passes, what kind of effect will this have on the wetlands park in Southern Nevada, or will or, or are they unrelated? I'm just wondering how this will affect that at all. For the record, Stephen Parrish, there would be no effect to the wetlands park. In fact, the original wetlands uh, mitigation uh, plan program that we did before actually provided funding to the wetlands park and they built some ponds with those uh, funds so they were actually the the uh, mitigation that was provided was actually done on the wetlands park so it really benefited them in that sense and it doesn't affect them at all really thank you mr parish thank you chair uh, thank you vice chair next we have senator daly please thank you mr chair and uh I know Warren doesn't know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, Steve will will ask you. <clears throat> so I want to try to understand this based on uh, what you, some of what you said. So we have a mitigation plan that's in place now, um, but generally you buy credits through a for-profit corporation. This would be like an alternate or a Plan B, um, which then uses a nonprofit or potentially does. So I'm just trying to understand how it actually works on the ground. You're a development, you're going to impact an area uh, that's wetlands now or impacted by the uh, uh, Waters Act, the Clean Water Act. And if you're going to disturb, you know, 10 acres, right, that means you have to then either trade and say, I'm going to replace this 10 acres with another 10 acres. Uh, so do you have to... Place, replace it acre for acre, uh, or you're going to buy credits and you're going to say in lieu of replacing this 10 acres I'm disturbing, somewhere else within the watershed I'm going to get credits and someone's going to take that money and then replace uh, the 10 acres. So is it an acre for acre type deal? How much do these credits cost? Are they all the same amounts? Or are they different amounts? Because it costs different amounts to, you know, to, to do that. Or... Uh, what's the deal? Or is it, can you do it piecemeal, a little bit here, a little bit there? Uh, and when you're replacing that, obviously, the size is going gonna, is gonna to matter. I, uh, I remember looking at a, a study a few years ago regarding the, uh, the, the rainforest, right? So they had a two-hectare area, which is like two and a half acres, and it was isolated. And they said, well, how much species degradation do we get from only having... Uh, one hectare and then 10 hectares and 100 hectares. Uh, and they found that, you know, 80% of the species are not supported in that small area. Uh, so, so how does some of that work? And I just have always questions about how credits work and people can bank them. Uh, I can get credits and then sell them to somebody else at a lower amount. Are they like a commodity and can be sold or do they have to go through these agencies? Because it I don't know if the feds have covered all that stuff, but hopefully it's in their regulations. I didn't read all 50 pages of it. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I'm offended that uh, Senator Daly didn't think I knew the answer to the question, but since I don't know the answer to the question, I'm wondering if we could confer first. <laughs> 
Thank you for the record, and thanks for the question. For the record, Stephen Parrish. Um, so what is done when we do a project, we have to go through a, to the core and, and get a 404 permit issued. So there's a studies that are done on the project that we're working on that determines the amount of acres that may be impacted, that are jurisdictional, that may be impacted by that project. And then as part of that, we also look at how, you know, how pristine is that area? Is it, is it heavily disturbed, urbanized area, or is it out you know, in a, in a nice pristine uh, area. And based on all that information, the core actually makes a decision on how many credits need to be purchased for how many acres. And they also, uh, sometimes they'll put a ratio on it. So if it's, if it's really heavily urbanized area, which most of the areas within the urban core of Las Vegas are, the, the value of those wetlands, the habitat value is pretty low. So what we're disturbing is not really that bad. And so they'll put a low ratio on it. In fact, they've done half to one ratios where we have to get half a credit to, uh, you know, per acre for that particular wash. If it was more pristine, sometimes we've been in areas that are more pristine, they could do a, a three to one where they do three credits to one uh, for that type of work. So it's really kind of site specific and dependent on where your project is located. Um, Keep in mind that the, the mitigation banks are, are limited in size. So um, they'll, through the process of developing the, the mitigation bank, they'll uh, come up with a proposal for an improvement. So for example, I, I mentioned the wetlands park and the ponds. They came up with one project, those ponds, and they, they, they figured out how much it would cost to implement those ponds. And then they had a, a per cost amount for, per, for each acre that would give them the resources to fund the construction of those ponds. And as I recall, it was around $5 million. It's been a while since that mitigation bank was done. But so, and I think each acre was around $57,000 that we had. So we'd have to pay, if we had, a, uh, if we had an acre of disturbance, um, we'd have to pay $57,000 if the ratio was one to one, and then that money, the $57,000 would go to um, the, the manager of that mitigation bank, and they would use that money to do the improvements on the wetland park. So the, wet, the wetlands park uh, mitigation bank has been used up. There's no more credits left on that. We've got another uh, uh, project that's underway, the Eglinton Preserve which has some credits and we're using those up and we're running out of credits, which is why we need to establish another mitigation bank. Uh, we want to do an in-lieu fee uh, program this time around because it gives us a little more flexibility with, uh, with how the credits are, are managed and um, have, you know, so that we can continue to construct our facilities, our flood control facilities in the future. Please follow. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just so I'm understanding, if, so you have the, the wetlands area that's uh, preserved, right, and they're able to sell credits. So I'm just trying to make sure I, uh, I understand it. If you've got 10 acres over here that you're disturbing and they have or have uh, the owner, whatever, says, hey, I have 10 acres that's out some other park that I'm not going to disturb, so I'm going to trade you, right? So you still lose 10 acres, or do you have to say, I'm disturbing 10 acres, I have to create or pay enough money for someone else to create 10 acres somewhere else? Uh, and is it acre for acre? And I know the dollars and all that kind of stuff. I've just, I've seen credit programs like this be abused, especially like when you're talking about for impact fees and stuff with cities and uh, on uh, housing and stuff like that. And I know it's not exactly apples to apples, uh, but is the intent to say, well, there's already a thousand acres in here that's uh, being preserved, so now I can disturb a thousand acres somewhere else and I'm going to get credit because I saved this thousand. Uh, and to me, that you're still disturbing another thousand acres and there's not going to be new uh, areas preserved. So how is it supposed to work? You're supposed to have maintain the same amount that you have, or you can disturb it, but just pay enough money that it doesn't matter. Thank you again for the questions. Again, for the record, Stephen Parrish. So it's really not a one-to-one. -one. We don't uh, disturb 10 acres and preserve 10 acres. What the, the bank does is it, it 
comes up with a project to restore or to rehabilitate or actually create new wetlands in a, in a certain project, a large site project. And then they put a value to that. At how much is it going to cost to do all that restoration, rehabilitation, or creation of, of new wetlands? And then based on that dollar amount, they assign a number, a certain number of credits to that bank and a certain dollar amount for each one of those credits. And then when a developer or an agency such as ours comes in and disturbs a, a certain number of acres, they apply based on that 404 permit, they decide how many credits need to be uh, issued or purchased to allow for that disturbance to happen. And again, that's based on how uh, established the wetlands are, is it heavily urbanized and that type of thing. And so it's, it's not really a one-to-one, -one, but the, keep in mind the Corps regulates this program. It's very well regulated. They don't just allow anyone to come in and buy a credit. You have to come in with a 404 permit application and describe your project, desc describe what the, the impacts are to the, to the uh, jurisdictional area. And then the Corps makes a decision on how many credits need to be purchased from that bank to offset your, your impact. And th thank you for that. Uh, and I think I got it. And you, you mentioned some of it, uh, you know, you might be in an urban area where the uh, quality of the, the areas you're trying to protect have already been degraded, this and that. So um, maybe it's not acre for acre, but you can do from the area that's uh, not as high quality or been degraded and do less work in a more desirable area and, and have it actually kind of balance out because it's higher quality and going to enhance and uh, make that area. And they have a formula for that. Um, so I think, I think at least I understand that part of it. And, uh, you know, like I say, the federal government's uh, got a program, not perfect, but it's better than what we have, I suppose. If I, if I may, Mr. Chairman Warren Hardy, I think uh, the, the central part of uh, Senator Daly's question is, is w whether or not these are actual commodities. I know, remember, back in the day when we had the smog and the emissions credits that people would buy and they would become commodities. As I understand it, this is very carefully regulated by the EPA and by the Corps of Engineers, and these, these credits, that no one would have a reason to purchase them or otherwise until it's been determined and I'll allow my client to correct me if that's wrong, but as I understand it, these are not sort of wheeled out there on the market. This is very tightly controlled. We're told exactly what we have to offset through these fees, and that's the amount we pay, and then they go very directly to mitigation projects. And I'll allow Mr. Parrish to correct me if I misspoke on that. Yeah, for the record, Stephen Parrish, that's exactly right. They they really regulate it. Um, they they do that through the issuance of the 404 permitting process, and they don't just allow anyone off the street to come in and purchase these credits and use them as a commodity. So, well well said. And thank you both for uh, walking us through that. At this point, I'd like to invite those wishing to come forward, wishing to testify in, Se uh, in Senate Bill 115, to please do so. Uh, Las Vegas or Carson City? Anybody wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 115? Good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Flores, Vice Chair Orenshaw, members of the committee. Joanna Jacob on behalf of Clark County. Um, just wanted to put our, our support on the record um, because as Mr. Hardy and Mr. Parrish stated, um, Clark County's Department of Environmental and Sustainability. We are serving as the regional sponsor for the mitigation bank. We will serve as the mitigation bank under this program. So we are working with the regional flood control district um, on this program and we are in support. And exactly as Mr. Hardy said, this is a very tightly controlled program um, administered by the Army Corps of Engineers. And so I think I've, I can get information on this for you, but I think they explained it very well. So thank you very much. Thank you. And seeing no one else, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us in support of Senate Bill uh, 115? You would like to testify in support of SB 115. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no one in support at this time. Thank you. 
Next, anybody wishing to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 115? Seeing none in Carson City or Las Vegas. VPS, anybody on the phone? If you would like to testify in opposition of SB 115, please press star 9 now. Chair, you have no one in opposition at this time. Thank you. And lastly, anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position to Senate Bill 115, Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, anybody on the phone, BPS? If you would like to testify neutral on SB 115, please press star 9 now. <coughs> Chair, you have no callers neutral at this time. Thank you. Any closing remarks you may have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Warren Hardy, representing the Clark County Regional Flood Control. Just to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for you recognizing how important this is to our economy and bringing this for, or to our environment and bringing this forward. Thank you, sir. And thank you. And with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 115. And we are now joined by our Senator Spearman. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. And we'll open up the hearing on Senate Bill 165. Whenever you're ready, Senator. present Senate Bill 165 for your consideration today. This relates to emerging technologies, and the bill seeks to expand Nevada's emerging technology industries uh, so that we know what's coming, when it's coming, and how we need to uh, get ourselves ready for it. I've got like five, six pages here, so let me just break that down and say this. I'll leave my notes aside. Um, how many people have ever heard of Meta? M-E-T-A, Meta. It's a new platform. And you've probably seen commercials where you see them talking about someone who is training to be a doctor or a cardiac surgeon or whatever, and they use this virtual um, uh, idea, and that's how they do it. They do it on um, on cadavers or whatever. And when you look at you look at that, and then you it's something like a CAD, okay, <laughs> computer aid, aid uh, design. Meta used to be fe Facebook. Meta platform came into existence in October of 2021. And that was right after we left session. And so if we had had a, a task force on emerging technologies, that task force would have been following that particular uh, development. Meta is, is expanding the whole virtual universe. Uh, Meta is also connecting social uh, networks and business platforms together so that it, it takes less time for individuals and businesses to connect. The, the idea here, here is that it's virtual and it's a, it's a way to make sure that there is uh, more synchronization when it comes to uh, business business plans, business planning, when it comes to new business development, et cetera. Um, at a $150 million investment in Meta. I think we might have somebody in Facebook here in uh, Nevada, uh, but what if we knew that that was coming? And that would have been a way for us to at least negotiate to see how we get involved, what's out there. The other thing that this uh, task force would do would be it would help us to make sure that in workforce development, K-12, post-secondary, uh, and beyond, technical schools and beyond, it would make sure that we were aligning our curriculum for the jobs of tomorrow, actually the jobs of today. I have, um, I have here a couple of, um, couple of jobs that are scheduled to be gone by the end of this decade. Um, first one is travel agent. Uh, the next one is taxi, drive, taxi cab drivers. The next one is store cashiers, and we're seeing that every day, uh, that going away. Number four, fast food cooks. And number five, administrative and legal jobs. Those are going away because more and more automation is coming into the workplace. Uh, in 20, 2007, 2008, in my neighborhood, when they built the uh, Smith's Grocery Store there, uh, it was 16 stations, and they were all staffed by a person. 
uh, somewhere along 2014, 2015, um, the, the, the stations that were staffed by a person started to decrease and the kiosk increased. I was, in, uh, I was at Nellis Air Force Base uh, at the uh, BX uh, a couple of months ago, and after I did my shopping, I went to what, what I thought was the checkout line, and guess what? It wasn't there. It wasn't there, and over here were six kiosks. And so we know that technology is coming along now and is starting to displace people. What the task, task force is all about is let's look out there and see what that looks like. And if there are opportunities for, for Nevada's business industry to exploit that, let's take advantage of that. We are growing, <clears throat> we're growing with, the set, with, with respect to businesses wanting to come here. But I think one of the things that happens all too often is we get, we get notified, if you will, uh, almost at the last minute. And I think if we have this technology task force in place, we will know not just what's coming, but we will also be able to work with GOED and with the Department of Education and some of the other uh, executive branch uh, partners. We'll be able to work with them to make sure that all of the things that we need to have in place are in place. Those of you who were around in 2014, I think it was when we first had um, Tesla, uh, one of the sticking points there was there was not a workforce, a ready workforce, for them to uh, work with. And so we partnered with them so that they could develop, you know, what, what was needed for the workforce and they got an apprenticeship program and all that. But with the, with the task force, we would already know that. And our education system would be aligned for that. Uh, we wouldn't be teaching people how to fix typewriters when uh, we're talking about handheld computers. So that's my spill on uh, Senate Bill 165. I've got some people here that want to testify. Uh, the long and the short of it is it would be housed in BNI, and uh, the director of BNI would be the one, business and industry would be the one to put it together. Uh, there'd be several different people that would, would be appointed. Someone asked, was well, there a fiscal note? No, it doesn't have to be, because one of the things that we learned in COVID is that uh, Zoom works really well uh, when you need to, to meet with folks. Uh, and so that's it. I'll stand for questions. Um, if you have any, it's after five, so I'm trying to give you the abbreviated version. <laughs> we appreciate that, Senator, and we would appreciate everybody in the audience paying attention to that. Um, if you intend to speak at any point, um, we appreciate quick diddles. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Daly, please. He, he talked me into it. No, I just have one uh, minor question i read through read through the bill looks in order i think the task force is can be useful as you were just uh, talking about in i think it's section eight sub b about uh, trying to identify barriers for people you know coming and various things what do you think some of the barriers are and i always get concerned when i say identify the barriers what are they because some people think that labor standards and those types of things are barriers <laughs> i don't think they're going to go there but uh, it always makes a flag. What are the other barriers you're thinking that they might be looking into? Well, the big, biggest barrier that we have right now is making sure that we have a ready workforce, making sure that, as I said before, our curriculum for K-12, post-secondary, technical college, uh, technical schools, and uh, other institutions of higher learning, make sure that they are teaching the things that we need. Uh, the bi that's the biggest barrier. I think the other barrier is uh, the unknown the unknown, we don't know what we don't know until we know it. And so what the task force would be charged with doing is, uh, in the military call it, leaning forward in the foxhole. Let's look at where the dots are and let's try to connect the dots. And maybe we can predict, predict accurately uh, what's about to happen in the technology uh, space or in innovation. Maybe we can do that. Maybe we don't do it quite as accurately as we wanted to, but guess what? We've gotten close enough so that we can, we're ready whenever uh, whatever's beginning, to, getting ready to happen, happens. So uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest barrier is workforce development. And, and I, I agree that uh, that's an issue across the board on, on many, many uh, issues. So hopefully they can uh, go from there. I just always worry about the recommendations. Uh, it's not a barrier to pay people fair wages and benefits. <laughs> It's, it's, not, it's not a barrier. As a matter of fact, I think it's an incentive, uh, which is what we looked at when, when we uh, looked at Tesla, Tesla coming in 2014. So it's not a barrier. Uh, I've got some other folks here who uh, are going to come out and talk a little, little bit about uh, some of the innovations that are taking place that we should be aware of, especially in the transportation sector. And so I will step back and let them come forward. I don't think we have anyone in Las Vegas, uh, but I'll step back, and I think they're still here.
And Senators, just for the sake of clarity, they are here to co-present, correct? Understood. Are they here wishing to speak in support? They're, they're here speaking in, in support, but okay, they're going perfect. to tell you why they support it. Understood. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and open up those wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 165, uh, Carson City or Las Vegas. I don't believe we see anybody in Las Vegas. We'll start in Carson City. Good afternoon. Welcome. Whenever you're ready. Hello, Will Adler for the record, representing uh, ACES Delta. I, I want to thank uh, Senator Spearman for bringing this bill forward. Uh, and I, I do think that uh, maybe this bill would have even been better last session because the, the, the wave of investment we've been seeing from the federal government actually has been leading towards more and more generalities and looking at states that are ready to put their hand up for opportunities. Uh, Nevada is already one of the few states that has a designated drone testing site, and even with the Ukraine war, we're seeing new and uh, recent investments from the Pentagon in automated vehicles, automated technologies, and again, artificial intelligence. So I think this bill is uh, right up the right alley, and we, we could even expand it into other fields as innovative as technology around energy expansion and new age energy uh, tech that uh, is coming to the state as well. So I, I thank the Senator for bringing the bill forward, and Nevada should be looking towards that innovative new edge instead of uh, sort of stagnating in the current technologies have because we are no longer the gaming and tourism state only. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Scott Leed. I'm representing Southwest Gas. Um, also happy to, to, to support this bill. Uh, Southwest Gas is heavily um, uh, invested in looking to the future, particularly around um, uh, clean fuel technologies like hydrogen, uh, renewable natural gas, and to the extent that um, this task force can can help uh, move some of those projects forward and also develop a and identify a future workforce for those types of technologies and projects, uh, we are supportive of that bill for, for those reasons and uh, appreciate the time. Thank you. And thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Nick Schneider, policy analyst for the Vegas Chamber. Uh, the Vegas Chamber is in support of SB 165. Uh, strengthening and diversifying our economy are priorities of the Chamber, and this bill seeks to do both. Uh, the Emerging Technologies tax Task Force's support of bringing uh, emerging tech businesses to the state and fostering their growth here will bring higher paying jobs uh, for our workforce, keep more of our talent pool in Nevada by providing more jobs that match the growing qualifications, and then provide more stability for our economy by increasing the number of industry sectors that uh, do business here in our state. Uh, we also support the creation of the Opportunity Center for Emerging Technology Businesses, as outlined in Section 10, uh, as it provides support and opportunities for both companies we attract to the state, as well as our locally grown startups that are emerging from innovation centers here in uh, Nevada. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. And thank you. Please, welcome. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Trey Abney with the Abney Talkin Group here representing the 2,000 member businesses of the National Federation of Independent Businesses here in Nevada. Uh, we obviously thank uh, Senator Spearman for bringing this bill. Uh, we, we support it. Most emerging technologies start out as small businesses, and so anything we can do to enhance, increase uh, the support for small businesses in Nevada, uh, we support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you. Welcome. Mr. Chairman Alfredo Alonzo with the uh, Law firm of Lewis and Roca, uh, members of the committee. Uh, we strongly support uh, uh, this bill on behalf of the uh, Auto Alliance, which is the 23 largest manufacturers of uh, uh, automobiles uh, in the world. And our latest, uh, our latest uh, inductee is uh, McLaren. So it's been a while, but we got them now. Um, this is obviously very important, whether you're doc talking about uh, the fact that Nevada was the first autonomous vehicle testing site in the country when, when that was, uh, and, and I still give him credit for it, the father of autonomous vehicles, uh, David Goldwater. Uh, uh, hope, he, uh, hope he heard that somewhere because he doesn't get enough credit. But uh, seriously, the, the fact that uh, that's where it started, we've, we've had, uh, you know, quite a bit of testing in the state. We're now looking at uh, other technologies besides electric vehicles. Uh, uh, we're looking at fuel cells, something that's near and dear to the senator's heart, um, and other technologies, uh, obviously, to make it uh, cheaper, easier, safer to, uh, to transport people from one, one place to another. Um, and at the end of the day, these emerging technologies, will in, they'll mean new jobs. They'll mean jobs, manufacturing, et cetera. So I uh, strongly support. Thank you. And thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. 
Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, John Sandy, uh, J-O-H-N-S-A-N-D-E for the record, uh, here today on behalf of Halo Car. Uh, Halo Car is uh, one of these companies that uh, is an emerging technology company that chose Nevada as its home. Uh, it's a, a fascinating company that is developing a remotely operated motor vehicles. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they chose Nevada because they felt that it was a good place to do the testing, uh, had favorable laws. Uh, the policymakers worked well with them to, uh, to get them started, and now they are growing and flourishing in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, they are hopeful that other companies uh, will join them and that we will create a community of innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, incubators for, for these wonderful ideas and these uh, amazing technologies. And so uh, I want to thank the Senator for bringing this. We think it's a, it's a great idea and great for our state. So thank you. And thank you. Please. Uh, Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Sina Lloyd, and I am representing myself at the moment. Um, I support this bill. Um, as, a, as someone who works in technology, but also as a former library director here in the state, um, I have seen what libraries do with emerging techno technologies, and I think that this bill um, just helps to emphasize the educational need that we have in the state. For example, in Project Sandy, which is um, with libraries and the Department of um, Economic Development. They are training um, individuals to do dialysis via virtual reality. And I think that's part of what uh, the senator was saying in her statements earlier. And I think this is very important for us to be able to do in very rural areas. Um, one example that I do recall from my time at the library was the library director working with um, individuals in McDermott to train those in rural counties to do dialysis via virtual reality to then be able to actually operate those dialysis machines in in their um, local communities. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Flores and committee members. My name is Wiz Rizard, Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity here in Nevada. Just want to thank first uh, Senator Spearman for bringing this bill forward um, and co-sponsors who helped also sponsor this bill. We feel that this bill is definitely one we're proud to stand behind and support. We believe it's a step in the right direction. As you heard previously from other people, Nevada, if we want to make it a model state for economic, economic opportunity, we've got to create an environment policy-wise that welcomes ideas. Uh, we'd be happy to continue this work by introducing uh, more ideas like um, regulatory sandbox where we can ensure that Nevada is the place most individuals with amazing ideas and creating new job opportunities can come to. So we greatly appreciate the senator and co-sponsor for bringing this bill forward and we support it. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I don't believe we have anybody else wishing to testify and support either here or Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone on the line? If you'd like to testify in support of SB 165, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hi there, can you hear me? We can. Great, um, hi, my name is Morgan Roth for the record. Um, I am the Senior Public Policy Manager for Motional, one of the leading economist vehicle companies in the country, but we have a huge stake in Nevada. Um, I'd like to echo the supportive comments made by others and how critical this bill is for emerging technologies and thank the Senator for pushing this bill uh, before uh, the committee today. Uh, I think this bill would best prepare Nevada to succeed in an ever-changing uh, technological future. As was mentioned earlier, AB, uh, Nevada has been a leader in autonomous vehicle technology, and it's important to keep up uh, the pace there with Nevada being at the forefront of innovation and new emerging tech. SB 165 would be a benefit to the state by ensuring that Nevada is best prepared for the future. Thank you very much. And thank you. BPS, do we have anyone else on the phone? Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. At this time, we'll go to those wishing to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 165, Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none, BPS, do we have anyone wishing to testify in opposition? 
If you'd like to testify in opposition of SB 165, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in the neutral position to Senate Bill 165. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome. Whoever wishes to go first. Virginia Starrett, for the record. The proposed bill in question establishes a task force to attract technology, businesses, investment, and revenue in Nevada. No one in this room would probably see bringing more businesses, revenue, and investment as a bad outcome. I would, however, point out that technology itself can have both good and bad outcomes. My organization, Protect Nevada Children, has been fighting for years for Nevada legislators, legislators such as yourselves to gain a better grasp of the many ways some technology is harming our children and families. As we speak in classrooms, the privacy of children, uh, students and their families across the state is being abused through unregulated third-party vendor data collection. On top of that, curriculum has become so politicized that the suggestion that the classroom teacher or a parent could monitor all content delivered through a school-associated device and screen out propaganda and political dogma is ludicrous. Here is one arena where government needs to intervene. Much of adult society has decided to put on what I call a cone of willful ignorance regarding the crucial need for children to be protected from exploitation through devices and the internet. And this appears to me to be in great part because it is extremely convenient to adults in this pressurized age to have children engaged or entertained and not in need of attention. Please don't put on the cone, but instead install protecting our children as a priority should you put this tax force in place. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, welcome. My name is John Epolito. I'm also with Protect Nevada Children. You can find 1,500 of us on Facebook at Protect Nevada Children. We are neutral on SB 165, but since there are three educators on the task force, we would like to get it on the record that we would be against student data being placed on the blockchain. This article I'll send to you guys, it's published in the markup. The markup is a very, um, they quote, here's their uh, tagline, quote, big tech is watching us, we are watching big tech. The markup is very respected and that's who others quote. They interviewed Roxanne Marsich, Marsich PhD uh, professor at San Antonio, and she wrote, quote, among the most troubling of emerging technologies I've seen in education are blockchain digital ID systems that do not allow for data on, on individuals' data ledger to ever be deleted, end quote. Very problematic. Um, we know Infinite Campus, we already have that. Every kid in this state has a massive Infinite Campus database, the most massive database ever created on children in the United States. It all is an Infinite Campus. It's a lot of it is not education related. It's discipline, minor discipline, medical, counseling, multi-tiered system of support, and unfortunately, psychiatric. You can go to protectnevadachildren.org to learn more about Infinite Campus. And if you live in Washoe County, you can go to protectnevadachildren.org to see the database Infinite Campus has on your children. For most kids in the state, by the time they graduate, it's probably between four and 500 pages. We at Protect Nevada Children adamantly oppose student data and information being placed on the blockchain. Thank you very much. And thank you. Whoever wishes to go next. Uh, Don, hey everyone. Don Gallimore, uh, senior and uh, board member of Protect Nevada Children. Uh, we have been doing this for over a decade now, trying to stop uh, the uh, the maintenance of uh, our student data in perpetuity. Uh, the most incriminating data in uh, pretty much history is in Infinite Campus. 
and it is uploaded into SANE. So for the most part, SANE uh, has all of our children's data, every bit of it. Uh, it's never deleted, and that's something that um, I, I'm under the uh, understanding that that's what the board is for. And um, my colleague, John, John Apolito, he has been the leader in this because he was the first to be charged $10,000 for a student's data. Um, but uh, there were numerous mistakes on it over time, and there's no chance to correct it. So it's like your credit scores. Uh, you get those credit scores, and you've got mistakes, and you can't get them off. Um, we do not want uh, any student data to be collected in its in, in perpetuity forever. We were able to stop um, uh, Governor Sandoval at the time. Uh, it, uh, maintaining information from birth to death. And uh, we were able to start that to uh, preschool, hopefully to 25, but we know that, we know better. Um, when SANE was built, being built, the ACLU and the 10th Amendment uh, Center, they opposed it, and we do too. Uh, one other thing, I am the uh, second vice president of the Renal Sparks and NAACP. We vacillated on how important data is in general, and uh, sometimes, progress is regression and in this case uh, in terms of data collection we believe that that's possible thank you all right thank you for joining us good afternoon thank you chairman flores uh happy to be here today uh to discuss this it's not often that i get to to talk about the business side of uh of bni uh we we typically are known as regulators and uh uh, we issue uh, 260,000 licenses uh, th through... I could just have you state your title and the name, please. Terry Reynolds, Director for the Department of Business and Industry. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we get excited about dealing with the business side of things and the promotion of, uh, of business within Nevada uh, outside of our, our uh, duties to, uh, to be a regulator. Uh, in the Office of Business Finance and Planning, which is located in our Southern Nevada office but works statewide, uh, we do three major uh, activities in there. We connect, uh, meaning that we connect with all the uh, business groups and chambers within the state. Uh, we hold a small business roundtable. When I first started having the roundtables, we had about maybe a dozen people. Uh, today we have, we average about 80 to 90 uh, people and it's we well over a hundred uh, at times we do it both in hybrid uh, we have people that attend at our business center on 3300 West Sahara and also virtually so we have every just about every chamber within the state participates at some point in time uh, within our business roundtable uh, we just uh, work with entrepreneurs uh, we educate entrepreneurs on how to get started what funding is available for entrepreneurs, what technology base is there to help them support their business. Uh, we actually bring in uh, small business development centers to work with them, entrepreneurial organizations to work with them, uh, funding resources to work with small business. And so we have a host of activities uh, that we can support small business uh, within our department. Uh, under our resource directory on our website, we have uh, basically uh, every business organization, every chamber listed. We have a business calendar that's updated on a monthly basis on what program activities are available for business. Uh, and then we conduct business programming uh, throughout the year uh, with everything from Small Business Saturday uh, to technical programs on labor issues, finance issues, entrepreneurial issues, uh, labor issues. Uh, labor development issues in terms of development of workforce. So those are the types of things that we do in business and industry. Uh, we also oversee 16 policy boards and nine advisory committees. We have 25 boards and commissions that we work with within business and industry. So we're pretty skilled at working with, uh, with task force commissions, business groups, and being able to conduct those meetings. When we consolidated our business um, and agencies within the uh, uh, business center at 3300 West Sahara and also industrial relations in that campus, uh, we created a system of 
actually having uh, technology involved in being able to broadcast. Uh, we can live stream from our offices. Uh, we can hold meetings and have it uh, either virtually or, or hybrid where we have uh, an audience that can participate. Uh, we have people online that can participate and we can live stream those meetings so that we can get out to the, to the public. So we have the technology and the basis to be able to do these types of task force. Uh, we do have a small um, uh, fiscal note on these to, to operate that. Uh, we would be able to do it with existing staff uh, that handles our business programming right now. We have an MA3 and an MA2, and our deputy director, Marcel Shearer, very experienced in terms of business programming uh, and working with businesses over a period of time. Uh, he came from the Small Business Development Center at the university, uh, so he has that background in, in business development, business help uh, for that. So I just wanted to let the committee know that we are able uh, to be able to handle this type of a program within uh, business and industry, and we've been doing a lot of the types of activities that you see in this bill uh, within our department. So with that, happy to answer any questions, but thank you for the time. And thank you for joining us. Members, any questions for our director? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Good, thank you. Next, we'll go to the phone. Do we have anybody wishing to speak in the neutral position for Senate Bill 165? Oh, over the phone. Who would like to testify neutral on SB 165? Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers neutral at this time. Thank you. Senator, any closing remarks, please? Thank you, Chair Flores. Uh, yeah, and let me address, and I probably hasten too, fit, too quickly in my opening remarks. So the task force is not about data collection for children at all. Uh, what it is about is looking at technology that's out there. Um, how do we do that? In 2019, um, when we were in session, people either had to come here or go to Grant Sawyer. Um, the pandemic hit, and we realized we've got technology that will allow people to be on the phone, uh, do Zoom, uh, even members. Uh, I was recovering from COVID, and that's why I could vote remotely. Uh, and so that's, that's really what it's, what it's tasked to do. Um, and if there is... Um, Anything that is uh, going awry with respect to, to data collection, especially for vulnerable populations, that's another thing that I believe that the task force can rein in, uh, and we would know that right now. Um, looking at those things is intermittent at best. Um, so so I, would, I would just uh, try to reassure those who were concerned about data being collected, we're not doing that. We're simply looking at technology that is and technology that might come. Uh, cyber cybersecurity is uh, part of this task force um, um, uh, recommendation. So we want to make sure that not only are children safe, but we want to make sure that whatever other data is out there, that that's safe as well. Um, a few, well, I think it was last month in February, uh, we had a um, we had a, uh, a presentation from the uh, Veterans Administration. Uh, and they were talking about how they're using uh, technology to help uh, veterans. And one of the things that they talked about was here in uh, Reno, they are working with the hospital so that they can do um, knee replacement for veterans and they're using virtual technology. When I asked uh, why hasn't that happened in Las Vegas, they said, well, we're trying to get there. And so this is the type of thing that I believe that the task force could help us to do. Uh, having a task force that looks at emerging technologies and industries also creates for us an ecosystem of economic development. Because for every one job that you create in the industries that I'm talking about, you're talking about 10 other jobs. And some of those jobs, at least four of those, would be entrepreneurial because somebody has got to supply the industry with the whatchamacallit when the thingamajig don't work and the doflachi is nowhere to be found. So, so we're talking about not just emerging technologies, but it's also a way uh, for, for our chambers of commerce to help uh, small business enterprises to, to grow. And so with that, sir, um, that's it. 
Thank you, Senator, for the presentation. We appreciate the work you've done and bringing so many folk together to work on this alongside of you. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 165. And next we have uh, Senator Neal presenting S Senate Bill 143, which I think you have promised you can keep it under two minutes. <laughs> Non-controversial bill. It'll be a quick combo. Senator Neal, whenever you're ready. So good afternoon, Senate Government Affairs. Um, thank you for allowing um, SB 143 to be heard. It is a replay from the 2021 session. Um, my name is Senator Dina Neal. Um, I'm going to have some opening remarks about this bill and why I am passionate about trying to bring this back. So the Fair Housing Act was passed in April of 1968. And there's been an ongoing effort since 1968 to ameliorate the inequities caused by discrimination. Today, I'm trying to deal with the discrimination issue of criminal history and housing. Um, it's also important to note that President Biden proclaimed Second Chance Month um, March 31st of 2022, and he asserted the importance of helping people who were formerly incarcerated re-enter society. I think it's really important for us to talk about the economic stability of folks that we have decided that are free, either been exonerated, pardoned, and now are a part of our society and they need to find a home. We all understand that housing is a great stabilizer for communities. And so when you ask a person to be released from prison, not only are they seeking identification, they're getting Medicaid, but they're also in need of finding a home. And if you're couch surfing, you're considered homeless. If you're on the street, even more so considered homeless. And when we try to make sure that a person who has a criminal history can find a home, we're also trying to make sure that they are not going to recidivate. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, SB 187. And so I know it's been a long day, but I want to begin by breaking down the bill in sections. So the first part of the bill, it's important to understand, like, how did this um, discussion around aligning ourselves with HUD, number one, bringing ourselves in compliance with the federal law under, the, under HUD, it has come about since 2005. There's been an ongoing discussion. We have a Nevada revised statute, two, NRS 233-153, which basically gave the legislative approval required for the commission to enter into a contract with the United States Department of HUD and to act as a certified agency. HUD has been um, seeking the Nevada Office of Equal Rights Commission to become a certified agency. I believe it started in 2019. But the power and authority is actually in statute, but we need the legislature to approve. And the changes that exist in the first section of the bill, which pretty much goes from section 1 to 32, are the conforming language that was asked for by HUD in order to get into compliance to become a certified agency to handle HUD complaints. And this is the third crack at the apple. The last time this bill was presented was presented by the um, NERC Commission, 
And then I took up the issue in uh, 2021, and now I'm taking it up again in 2023. The second phase or the second part of the bill deals with ban the box and the criminal history related to individuals who have been charged with a criminal offense. And that language pretty much starts from the center of the bill on page 24 all the way to page 30, well, section 32, all the way pretty much to the end of the bill. And so I will go high level, very high level, go through the um, sections one through 32 in a really simplistic way. Uh, if you look at, I'm going to start with section 14. There's no reason to go through definitions. Um, section 14 of the bill basically um, identifies what the commission shall do in order to uh, create a settlement agreement, which in, in this case is called the conciliation agreement. Um, it continues to lay out um, what the um, settlement agreement uh, should entail. If you go to section 14 uh, sub A, which is actually section 14 uh, sub four sub A, it talks about how the attorney general um, shall prepare a notice of hearing, um, and they can be included if an individual, an aggrieved party, is not trying to go through the commission. But it allows the attorney general to take up the issue, or the aggrieved party um, may place it in a court of competent jurisdiction. Um, on page six, the bill continues to talk about how um, a hearing may be held, talks about the process, what happens if there's one or more violations of law. And then on page seven, the bill talks about in section 15, um, it discusses um, the probable cause standard, what kind of practice should occur, what happens if um, someone elects to move it to the court, what happens if um, they elect to, um, if they request the uh, action by the Attorney General. And then on page 8 in section 16, it refers basically back to um, section 14, and it basically talks about the petition for judicial review. It talks about judicial cross-petitions. And then on page 9, it talks about the procedure for a cross-petitioner when they want it, um, when they're um, dealing with an aggrieved party where they're claiming that housing discrimination has occurred. And then it continues to talk about the judicial review and then what happens when the commission gives a decision. On page 10, it talks on um, sub, subsection 17, line six on down. It talks about what happens when you want to remand. Um, if a court is um, attempting to remand, um, or affirm a commission opinion. It also then talks about the stay of a final decision. And then once you get into section 18, basically it lays out that the words that are said in the building, in the, in the bill, definitions are the definitions. Um, in section 20, this is conforming language that basically lays out what the um, commission is supposed to do. It adds in the familial status, national origin, religion, which is all complying, um, compliance language that HUD asked for. Um, page 13 continues conforming language. Section 22, um, it talks about that the commission may contract uh, with the basically the Department of HUD, which has been in statute since 2005. It just requires the legislative permission. And section 23, it basically says that um, the commission shall accept any complaint that's presented to them. And if the complaint alleges an unlawful discriminatory practice, then um, the agency must attempt or seek to investigate and settle the try to settle the complaint and then on page 15 it talks about the notification process explaining the rights to the individuals and then it continues uh, to talk about the times in which these processes must occur when we look at section 25 section 26 and then the rest is pretty much conforming language um, and then I will go ahead and jump to section 32, which is probably the meat of the bill and the meat of the opposition in the room. Because if anyone is um, 
seeking to oppose us getting in alignment with federal law, then we probably have a larger issue of discussion. Um, section 32 is the provision of the bill which is focused on fair chance housing and ban the box. Section 32 lays out who is an aggrieved person and whether or not that person believes that they have been unlawfully discriminate, discriminated against. The bill, I'm seeking to try to change and give some parity between uh, citizens who have a criminal history and allow them to be able to get housing. I also have an amendment in the section 34. And so in the amendment that you have in your exhibit, if you look, I have it on line 19, there would be an insertion here that um, when we're talking about inquire into the uh, conduct or background of a person, I'm making it absolutely clear that I am trying to give um, access to housing to persons who have been legally freed, completed their time in prison or jail, been acquitted, pardoned, or exonerated of a crime. And I think that there is no reason to deny a person um, a home if they have actually served their time. And we need to make sure that those individuals can have a roof over their head, stabilize themselves, stabilize their families, make sure that they're not um, uh, going to recidivate, and also have the opportunity not to return to a housing environment that may create a um, potential threat of reoffending. Um, I have heard um, several um, statements that, you know, why would I want a criminal uh, living next to me? And I, the question that I state is, well, why did we free him from prison if you didn't feel that they were rehabilitated in the first place? If they were released from jail and the con conviction didn't stand, then why are we attempting to prevent that person from um, having uh, a roof over their head. And I'm going to pause here and give you an example on why I wanted to include inquire or refuse to rent or refuse to negotiate for the rental of a lease. So prior to COVID, I had a young woman who was pregnant. She had a child on the way. And I had worked with social services. I worked with Division of Welfare. I had, um, she had a snowball effect. She had, her insurance was canceled, all kinds of things going on. But the main issue that was going on was that we were working with Help of Southern Nevada to try to figure out how can we find her a place. Um, she, had a, she took the list of uh, applying to apartments based on the subsidy that Help of Southern Nevada was going to give her. And then after we went through a couple of months of identifying a place where she could live and it ended up being a one bedroom apartment where she was going to live with two children and a pregnant and a pregnant, a baby on the way. And she was denied, um, her lease was denied because she had had prior solicitation charge. And so I had to engage in calling the actual apartment and basically stand in the gap and explain to the apartment manager what we had gone through for three to four months of trying to stabilize this particular individual and that if you were going to deny her for a solicitation charge from three or four years ago that we were going to be in a worse situation because she literally had no place to live. And it really dawned on me at that moment that there is a whole population out there of individuals who are being denied access. So before I brought the bill, um, I had a stakeholder group with women um, and mothers that had been formerly incarcerated, and they talked to me about what was going on in the space, how they were being discriminated against, how they were getting triple and double deposits, how if they went into some of the weeklies that they would then run their criminal history and then within 24 hours evict them and then not be able to get their deposit back. And that was a significant issue and problem. And these sections in the bill attempt to deal with those um, concerns that were brought forward to me um, to address the issues around fair housing for folks that have been uh, freed or have a criminal conviction. So if you go to um, section 35, um, it talks about this um, requiring a guarantor 
to um, have proof of income that's not greater than three times the monthly rent or the lease. The reason why I put in Section 35 is because um, over the interim while we were out, I was finding out that they were asking co-signers to come up with five times the amount of the rent. And this wasn't just an offender. This was a regular person seeking an apartment. And I was like, well, why, why would a co-signer need to come up with five times the rent when the applicant has to come up with three times the rent? That makes no sense. All, your, your goal of the co-signer is for them to be able to pay the rent in the absence of the person losing the job correct? So I'm like, so why would we, a co-signer, have to pay five times the rent? And I was like, in a housing crisis, you're never going to get um, a family, of, even a middle income family, to have to be able to come up with five times the rent. And so I'm trying to deal with that inequity and say that the co-signer and the applicant, it's even, it's three times the monthly rent that an individual should have to come up with. Because I think it's excessive and I felt like it was almost predatory because if you're a parent, just trying to stabilize someone. If you're also for a criminal, someone with a criminal history, if you're trying to stabilize your family member who just got out of uh, prison or jail and they've been freed, how are you supposed to come up with that money? And so that, I feel, fills a larger issue of an inequity that's happening in the system um, because we need to be able to allow folks to co-sign for someone else and be able to move forward um, and live in an apartment where they feel that they are going to have um, the ability to live in a safe environment. Um, the amendment, um, so if you, the amendment, and I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go through the rest of the sections. Um, there's an amendment that you guys have that basically lays out that sex offenses are exempted. And then I attempted to also exempt in section the violent offenses, and that needs to be cleaned up because when you look at NRS 200, everything's in NRS 200. It's a misdemeanor battery that's in NRS 200. Um, I also have an exemption in there on what this applies to. So single family homes, single family residences that where it's an individual unit where the owner owns less than four, they are also exempted out of this bill as well. And so with that, I'm sure you guys have questions, so there's no reason to continue to belabor the point and just go forward with all the questions that you guys have to ask. It's a pretty thick bill, so it's not my first rodeo. And so I'm ready, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate your energy. All right. <laughs> um, I think the roads are closed. I don't know how I'm getting home. Fair enough. Uh, so thank you again for the bill, and, and I think the members have now had an opportunity in multiple sessions to engage in this conversation. So I think that will, at a minimum, allow for the focus to be more uh, narrowly tailored to specific sections of the bill versus having to engage in a debate that we've had already in this body. With that, members, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we'll start off with Senator Daly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, my questions aren't going to be about uh, the necessity for the bill, more just about how it actually works and, and applies. <clears throat> I know in like uh, Section 34, 4A, when it uh, gives a definition, let me find it here. Anyway, it, it says that uh, it has to be owned by a natural person. I think it's, uh, what are they talking about in the definition? Page 25? Okay. Line 25. Page yeah. 25. Yeah. Um, when it talks about a natural person there, so the provision of this section, except as otherwise provided in B, apply to a dwelling that is owned by a natural person. So to me, who does that narrow it down to, right? Is, is, if a dwelling is owned by a corporation, it's not covered anymore? Or? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Neal. So this was an amendment that came forward. Um, 
from when I was having a conversation with the Realtors Association. And so basically, natural person is already in law. And there was a huge debate around whether or not I was just talking about apartments, two, fourplex, twoplex, or whether or not I was trying to apply this to single family owned residences, meaning I then was going to apply this bill to uh, Senator Daley's home and say that this law would then apply to you where you could not discriminate against a person with criminal history. And so the cleanup language is that this is actually in, in sub four. That would change to four or more. Um, I didn't want this to apply to single family homes. I had no intention of having this apply to someone who is owning a home in a neighborhood that they would be exempted from this. And that's why it had the natural person language. We toyed around with you know different um, language, but it really to get at what I was talking about, I didn't want it applied to single family homes. That's a simple answer. Uh, understood, and I just, so it, so it won't apply to <clears throat> the neighborhood house or a rental that an individual has. There are other provisions that would prevent them from doing some of these other discriminatory practices. As, as I understand what the law is, you still can't discriminate for Correct. a variety of other reasons. Um, but I, did, I wanted to understand that and make sure that, because it seemed like it was a limiting factor. I wanted to make sure that's what it was limiting to. And I'm assuming the same limitations apply in the Section 35 portion of it for the, the co-signer and all that kind of stuff. It, really applies to the same category of people, 34 and 35. Correct. Okay. And then uh, if I can ask one final one. I had a couple other questions, but I think I got it, and most of it was answered. I had a question that was answered later in the bill. You, you know how that happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the last one, and the only one that I even <clears throat> have kind of an objection on, and I don't really understand it, is Section 30. When the exclusion from... The regulatory process under 233B and the exclusion says in relation to judicial review and I I'm I know when you said in your testimony that a lot of that was language that was given in the first what sections down to 35 or whatever were from the fed, feds in order to be in compliance with what they wanted but that one baffles me and you know how I hate to exclude anyone from regulations you know that right? so, <laughs> so are we talking about, so you're saying in Section 30, 233B.039, which is existing law? Correct. And the existing law there in 233B.039 says that the regulatory process under 233B doesn't apply to the following, the governor, blah, blah, blah. And you get down to the end, and it says it doesn't apply now to Chapter 233 at all uh, for... Uh, judicial review of decisions of Nevada Equal Rights Commission concerning an unlawful discriminatory practice in housing. And I have no idea what it is that they're thinking about excluding from a regulatory process regarding judicial review decisions. I, and I don't like to exclude anyway. So. so, thank you for that question, but so I don't have an answer for that because the way I understand a couple things about, number one, NERC. Um, there's a firewall already in statute in between NERC and the governor, NERC and Dieter. Um, and that came into play in 2019. And I don't, and I don't know if someone else can, um, uh, Mr. Jarrett uh, can speak to this, but I know that there is a firewall, period, in looking into a charge, asking about a charge, trying to impede and tamper with a case that is currently going on in NERC, that it is not up for, um, I would say, the regulatory process to engage. And when I look at sub C, which is um, talking about at that long list when you talk about these uh, special provisions, the chapter 233 of NRS for the judicial review of decisions of the um, Equal Rights Commission, that seemed to 
kind of I the way I interpreted it, I thought it was just rolling in that firewall that already exists in statute to prevent um, folks from, I think, engaging in a charge that's already there or, you know, using some kind of uh, that's what I thought it applied to. So if I'm wrong, I thought it was a firewall that was already there from 2019 that was preventing this from coming into the regulatory process. And I, and I appreciate that. We just need to look at it a little bit more because when I look at the rest of the list and you look at other people that are exempt, of course, the governor's office, uh, ANSHE, Office of the Military Gaming Control Board. So when they're doing a regulatory process and setting the you have the statute and they say this is how we're going to administer it, they don't have to go through the hearing and the workshop and then come to the uh, LCB and then go through legislative commission to do that kind of stuff. So when I get down to this and I understand the firewall, I just can't imagine where NERC, the whole chapter 233B, is going to be putting in a regulation regarding judicial review decisions. I know judicial view, review decisions are made by the court as far as... So I'm not understanding how it ties in, uh, and maybe we both need to look at it a little bit closer, and if it makes sense and needs to be there, we'll, we'll look at it. But uh, I looked at it, besides my general prohibition against letting people out of regulatory process, um, I'm not sure how it would ever play into the, why they would ever have a regulation regarding any of that anyway. That's a good question. Um, I will try to find out the answer for that on the judicial review part, but I had just assumed it was part of the firewall and it was an extension. And then I also believe that it was because the judicial review, there's also an internal process to determine whether or not the commission, um, because it's an aggrieved party that's going to trigger this anyway, right? And so I just... That's what I thought it was, so I'll double check. Um, I know that NERC, last time I had NERC able to um, present and answer some of the um, nuanced questions, but um, they were not allowed to come and present on this bill. Thank, thank you on that, and we'll, we'll, we'll get it figured out, and uh, maybe it just needs to be worded differently or something, but uh, um, if it needs to be there, then we'll take a look at it from that point of view. Uh, Senator Krasner, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your presentation, Senator Neal. So I have some questions on Section 34, Sub 2A. Um, so a person may inquire into or conduct a background check to determine whether an applicant for the rental or lease of a dwelling has a conviction record or record of criminal history that is, and, and I'm, I was happy you put this in, a violent or sexual offense as uh, defined in NRS 202.876 or the equivalent in another jurisdiction, which includes murder, rape, human trafficking, uh, lewdness with a child, false imprisonment, battery, pornography with a minor. But then when I read the amendment, it says that if somebody has uh, completed their time in prison or jail, then you can't check it. So it, it almost seems like it, the amendment takes that away. And so I'm not sure if that's the intent or, or what is. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dina Neal, thank you for the question. So the intent is that, because I was, I was having these philosophical debates of when should a person have a right to housing, right? And so I was trying to make it explicitly clear that I feel that a person should have the right to housing if they have a criminal history, if they've already served their time in prison, they've already been uh, released from jail, not convicted, they've been pardoned and they've been exonerated. Why is there a reason to deny them housing? And so I'm delineating that. And then the look back that I have on the five years, and I didn't even have this prior, um, was to make sure that, because you could fall in that gray area. So if you were convicted, not exonerated, you have a criminal history, right? Um, 
there is there is a nuance there of that we, I think that needs to be I think examined, and that's why I was giving the five year look back on the violent criminal history, mainly because it keeps popping up right as a conversation point. I don't want a violent murderer living next to me. But then when I talked to about when I was uh, speaking to some people about recidivism, they were saying a person that had served 30 years in prison for a murder was the least likely to recidivate if they actually were released from prison. And so when I created the um, sex offender um, exemption, when I went with the stakeholders, which were the formerly incarcerated women and mothers, they specifically asked for that exemption. And so I think the sex offender piece, it doesn't matter, period. That is an automatic, no look back, you are just not even considered. That is, they're co completely eligible to be discriminated against. And the reason why I put that in there is because that was just hands down, no crossing the line. Everyone agreed that that was something that needed to be um, placed in the bill. And I agreed to that um, last session. The only difference in, in the amendment is that on the violent offenses, I'm giving the five-year look back. Currently, we don't have a look back period at all. You could go back 30 years on somebody right now in the state of Nevada and say, well, in 1977, you committed a crime. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lease to you, period. It's currently happening um, where even if you had, um, it could be, it could be a misdemeanor. Didn't matter. You're, they're not going to lease to you. And so I wanted to make sure that I was putting my purpose when this whole amendment comes back together, that I am specifically talking about people who have been freed. There is no reason to continue to discriminate against a person who has already say who has already served their time. They've already supposedly been rehabilitated. That's why we released them from prison. That's why we acquitted them. Why are we discriminating against them at all? Please follow up. So I just want to clarify if 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 a land may a landlord because I'm trying to connect the I feel like it's inconsistent with the amendment with with the bill in front of me. May a land if a landlord looks up someone's criminal background history and finds that they were they committed murder or sexual assault or lewdness with a child but they have been released from prison, can the landlord then refuse to rent the apartment to them? So thank you for the question, Senator Neal. So here's what's the expectation in real world, right? That if this bill passed, you would then change your application form to then address these exemptions that I have, right? So then the application form would then, instead of asking just a general criminal history, it would then select those violent offenses, then it would select that sexual offenses and then list those out. And then that person would check that box and then, then you can inquire into those particular offenses. But if, if there is a, and, and ideally, if you have a box that you're going to put and say, have you actually been exonerated, freed, pardoned, and then you say yes, there's no further questions. Because we have to talk about the real application, right? So if the bill passes, you then have to do a conforming process within your application procedure about what you're going to ask about. And this bill would limit what you're going to ask about. Is that, does that make it clear? I just wrote a plain sentences that has nothing to do with LCB legalese that would go into section 34, line 19 that section and so i that's how it would work that's that is exactly how it would work i'm not there have been other cities there haven't really been too many states but there have been other cities that have actually passed ban the box policy or fair chance housing policy and what they have done is that they have limited the inquiry into the criminal history of the individuals they have exempted certain crimes because there are certain crimes that I guess 
people generally feel very strongly about, such as violent offenses, sex offense, and anything where you have engaged in some lewd offense with a child. So in other cities, what they have done is that they have gone in and changed the application process and made sure that, um, so I'll say Montgomery County, Maryland, for fair chance, fair chance housing, what they did was they changed the application process to make sure that a conditional offer was made to those individuals. Um, in, in Newark, they, what they placed on, they put the, on the rental application that they could only inquire about certain arrests, right? So whatever is exempted in this bill, that's the only thing that you're gonna ask about. That's it. And next we have Senator Goykachia, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we're kind of headed down the same path, Senator. I, you know, the bill kind of te technically says, hey, you can't inquire about their past record because they, and they're checked the box that said they've been pardoned, exonerated, whatever. But you still have to check to make sure what they checked in the box is true. Now, is that a violation? I mean, how do you substantiate the application? Thank you for the question, Senator Neal. I mean, Senator Neal, for the record, um, I don't think that's a hard process. I think when you go through an application process, not only are you submitting your income, you're submitting potentially prior residence, you're filling out where you lived before, um, you're also submitting um, utilities, different things, um, I'm trying to think about what did I have to submit, because I actually have a house, but what did I have to submit every time I came to Carson City? Um, I had to turn over bank statements. So why wouldn't this just be an, an, an additional, you check the box, I need you to supply this additional information that's proof that you've been exonerated. I'm almost positive that a person that's been pardoned and that's been freed, that's been exonerated, that's been convicted, is making sure that they are not gonna to continue to be challenged on the point that they have been freed from NDOC. And I think it would just be an additional piece of paperwork that would come in in order to establish that um, the application is true and correct, right? We all sign this document that says everything that you say is true and correct. And what I've seen in other cities, what they did was basically they offered a, um, they offered a um, conditional offer for the lease, and then they did a check. And then the offer was then completed, or it was rescinded. And that's not a violation because you're giving them the conditional offer of acceptance and then you have this window to check to make sure that all the documentation is correct. I just wanted to make sure, uh, again, the way the, law, the, the way the bill is written, that it wouldn't be a violation for the landlord if, in fact, after he received the application, did, in fact, go back and, and do some background check to verify that what was on that application. I mean, we, you're still going to have that. How do you, you check the box, but that doesn't mean it's, yeah, and you signed the affidavit, but you so, still have to have the ability as the landlord, I guess, without breaking what you're putting in, in this law, without a violation of the law for the landlord to go back and check, well, say, okay, I, I need to check and make, check with the pardons board. I don't know who you check with, uh, find out, uh, you know, if in fact you are truly pardoned and you have a clean record. And, and I guess just, just want to make sure that your intent is that, you know, that wouldn't be a violation for a landlord to do that. That That is my intent. When I looked at what other cities had done, and I believe there are, it's at least uh, 10 cities that have done ban the box. And when I looked at their process on how it was working, because other, other places have done this well before um, this bill. And so what they did was, they did a conditional offer so they wouldn't be in violation of the law of just flat out refusing someone, right? And then they did a um, review of all the materials that were turned in and then they checked to make sure that what the person attested to was true. Um, and I'm okay, I, that's the way I anticipate that process to work because um, but you still need to be allowed to check the box, right? Not just to say, well, turn in your criminal history. 
tell me whether or not you had um, an assault, right? You at least need to give that person the option to say that, you know, I am following, you know, SB 187 was to pass out that I am actually, yes, I've been convicted, but I've also been freed. And so here are my papers, and I'm adding this in with my application to prove that I am actually this person. Um, and that I, number one, I'm saying that this happened, and I'm saying that none that I've actually been freed from NDOC. And I think this is always a sticky wicket because even um, when I had this bill before, someone asked me, well, why, why can't they just carry like a freedom card? Like I've not, I haven't committed any crimes for the past five to seven years. And I'm like, is that really real? Um, that's not anything we would ask anybody else to do, right? And I'm trying to say that just because you have a criminal history and if you've served your time and be free, then why are we treating them different than a regular citizen? Because at the point where they re-enter society, they actually did become a regular citizen. And either the decision is that you are no longer paying for your crime, or I need to keep you in prison or in jail forever because I don't believe that you're ever going to be rehabilitated. And I just want them not to be on the street. I don't want them to come from, in Vegas, the halfway house to their mother's couch or to their girlfriend's couch and never become sustainable individuals where they can take care of themselves. I tell you, having a roof over your head and having some dignity about your life is one of the most powerful things that can happen in order to keep a person from reoffending. And I completely agree with your statements. I just want to make sure we're not going to make criminals out of a landlord that is trying just to do the process. And, and I, I hear you. And unfortunately, if it is, a, if you've been charged with a sexual offense, you know, that's pretty tough to get away. You know, I mean, it's there for, I had a 85-year-old constituent, you know, that was charged, you know, 70 years ago. And he still got a report every 30 days. Thank you for that, this is Senator Neal. That's one of the issues that I think it's a hard one to climb, right? You've, Senator Gokatia, you've been in this building for a really, really long time. You've seen that process come through this building in 2015 where we automatically changed the tiers of sex offenders regardless of whether or not you did the act in 1912 and you're 98. And for whatever reason, we have just decided that this particular group is the pariah and they will never be, um, able to come from underneath that. And, and although I believe that there should be some, some movement, right, around a 70-year-old or someone who's not reoffended since 1983, we are not at that place in Nevada where we're ready for that conversation. And we had that conversation in 2011. We had it in 2015, and as progressive as this legislature is moving in 2023, I can tell you we're not going to have it. <laughs> Members, any additional questions? And, and I'll just take a personal point of privilege, more, more or less just to say thank you, Senator. I, I think this body has often tried to tackle the question on what punishment is what rehabilitation is, and I don't think we've been able to identify that. I know individuals, when they uh, are incarcerated, it's not just where they're going to live, it's where they're going to work. It's what opportunities are going to be afforded to them, what skill sets can they can actually get, what prison actually does to them. Uh, uh, so I just appreciate you engaging in this conversation because uh, I think as a society we have a responsibility to engage in it. Um, and I think we, we often want to break this conversation down to what a business wants, um, and we skip holistically what we need as a society to address some of these concerns and, and how to ensure that we reincorporate human beings uh, back into society in a meaningful way. Uh, I, the, other, the only thing that, that I would ask maybe is to engage in the conversation, and you, you've alluded to it now already, but I think we, we also should just really kind of methodically walk through what's happening right now. I'm incarcerated. I come out. I now have a record. And what, if we don't do anything, we keep the status quo as it is today. If we could walk through what is, what are the, what's the likelihood of me finding housing? 
what's the likelihood of me being able to reincorporate into society? Because I think what we're skipping in the conversation is, well, some people need to make money, and I respect that. But in, in, in the grander scheme of the conversation is, what does that mean to society when we have individuals that are coming out? What, what, what can they expect? And I think you've mentioned sometimes it's couch surfing, sometimes it's going back into uh, trying to find hopefully a family member that can take them in. But w what if you don't have that? <coughs> what, 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 what else is happening out there? If you could walk us through some of those. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Flores, Senator Neal, for the record. So what's happening more often than not is some form of homelessness, right? And some form of basically recidivating and then returning back. From what, from the conversations that I've had, there is a sense of depression and feeling like I'm never going to get away from my past. I'm never going to not be challenged on what I've done. And for the mothers who are leaving prison and seeking to reenter society, there are children that we have to consider. And when they can't put a roof over their children's head and they can't put a roof over their head, it creates another dynamic of how they survive within the space. And I think it leads to other behaviors that we don't want to see. So, for example, the, the example I used about the young woman who had the solicitation charge, I had to ask her, how the heck did you start solic soliciting? Her boyfriend was pimping her out. She couldn't go home to her father. She couldn't go home to her mother. So she relied on him to put a roof over her head, and in exchange for what that relationship was going to be, that's what he asked her to do. Now, mind you, he used love <laughs> as the way to cajole her into that situation. But once she decided that she didn't want to do that and that was not how she wanted to present herself, she broke up with him, but that's how she got the solicitation charge. And so when you talk about what a person will do in desperation, I've seen it. I've seen people do things that I can't imagine ever doing because there is a sense of survival. So whatever I have to do in order to stay under your roof with you so I'm not on the street, that's what I'm going to do in order to make that work. I will stay in an abusive relationship. I will stay with a man that beats me because I can't go and get my own apartment. I will stay with my mother who probably um, already has, lives on social security because I can't go lease an apartment because my conviction record is denying me access. And so not only are we thinking about the extra familial burden that's going on, it is changing the dynamic for those individuals because when I talk to them, it's almost like they've lost hope about their life. And, and at the same time, we're, we put them in a workforce program. We're putting them in a reentry program saying, I want you to find a job. I want you to take care of yourself. However, the housing issue I cannot fix for you. And we need to have a conversation about what that means because we're expending the government dollars to put them in the reentry program. We are. We're expending the government dollar to pay for the Medicaid that helps them get the care once they're released. We're expending the money in order to help them get that ID. So at what point in this conversation do you say, oh yeah, I'll help you get the job, but not the house. I'll help you get the job, but you can't stay next to me. You can't live in my neighborhood. You can't live in my apartment building. At what point are we deciding that this individual, because I'm like, if, if, they're an, if, they're, if they are a subhuman, if they're less than, then call it out for what it is and don't let them out. But if you have decided that they're an equal human being just like you and me, then you better start giving them the same rights and treating them as if 
they are a regular citizen because you have signed the papers, they've gone through the process, and you have said, I believe this person will not reoffend, so that's why I've allowed them to not be convicted. That's why I've acquitted them. That's why I exonerated them. That's why I pardoned them. That's why I let them out after 20 years, 10 years, 30 years. So, so my question is, if they're less than a regular person, say that. But that's not my position. Thank you, Senator. Members, any additional questions? Um, I will take one quick point of privilege uh, just to, I was supposed to be in a panel right now with the UNLV Young Dems, um, but obviously this is an incredibly important subject matter and I know they're all watching, so instead of uh, being on that panel, they're joining us in this hearing and I just wanted to do a shout out to them because I feel bad that I couldn't make it. Uh, but sending you a shout out and thank you for joining us, uh, Young Dems. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to join us uh, in support of Senate Bill 143, either in uh, Las Vegas or Carson City. And then afterwards, we'll move on to the phone. Uh, and we'll start here in Carson City. Hi, good evening <laughs> and welcome. I thought you were joining us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Whenever you're ready, please welcome. Uh, thank you, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Adler with Silver State Government Relations, today representing NAMI Nevada. So what the Honorable Senator Neal said, <laughs> and to add a little bit to that, uh, NAMI is in support of this bill because, one, Senator Neal started making the argument for housing stability. And we are bringing before the Senate, Senate Bill 68, which creates funding for housing stability. So I think um, we're very well aware of that need as well. But more than that, many persons who suffer from mental illness have been incarcerated. And many times it's when they achieve the stability of incarceration that they actually have the opportunity to come to understand their conditions, to achieve medical medication stability that they are willing to retain. In fact, prior to COVID, NAMI Western Nevada, which I'm proud to be a founder of, we were in uh, medium here off of Snyder Road running uh, what we call NAMI Connections, which is a peer recovery support group. And we had such success, we had 13 peer leaders in medium running connection support groups, that was the degree of revelation of folks who are incarcerated that they have a condition. And so those folks, when they left that institution, they need the ability to access housing. So thank you for this opportunity to register our support. And thank you. Anybody else wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 143? Seeing none in Carson City or Las Vegas, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? If you would like to testify in support of SB 143, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in support, please press star nine now. Caller with the last three digits of 222, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, please how y'all doing tonight? We can hear you. Hello? If you could please state your name for the record. Welcome. Okay, my name, how, how you doing, man? My name is Adrian D. Patterson. Uh, and I'm a formerly incarcerated person. Uh, I uh, came through the uh, FIT program, big ups to uh, Michael Hollis. And uh, I have uh, addressed this, uh, read what uh, Senator Neal has written. I just want to be brief here. I know how the time is what's called. First and foremost, uh, shelter is a basic human need and a human right, okay? It's, it's, it's basic. It's, it's self-explanatory. When you have a roof over your head, now you can make moves to be productive within the community, look for work and everything, but it's, it's basic, Okay. When you ban banning housing based upon prior criminal records after release, it's not only unnecessary, but it can only increase the likelihood of reincarceration, relapse, and further crimes. That's all it can do. 
Okay, and it's a form of discrimination because it renders our fellow citizens the status of third class citizenship. Okay, we're talking about increasing uh, uh, charging three times the rent. Come on, it, it's ridiculous. And finally, because anybody, anybody, any one of you, all you guys seem to be educated. Anybody with at least a third grade education knows who get locked up more disproportionately as far as the racial, black and brown people. We ain't going to sugarcoat it. We're going to call it what it is. So by deduction, it appears to be an attack on minorities by a power structure who don't look like them at all. Why is that relevant? Because you, 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 you're always marginalized as somebody other. So you can go, you go, you go, what, what do you, if you release somebody, okay, what is the, the job of probation officers, POs, police? We have checks and balances in this city to, to review the citizens that have been released from the prisons. Now, let me make this brief. I haven't been here long. I've been here, I came in September. I got hit by a car. I have a prior criminal record from 27 years ago. I have not even a parking ticket in the state of Nevada. Okay, and yet I'm affected by the, the, the housing uh, discrimination issue. I just got hit by a car. I can't leave. All my doctors is here. My pain manager, everything is here now. I can't leave until I get my legal issues resolved. Okay, so my point is, why should, that, why should I not be allowed the, the basic decency of, uh, of paying my bills, providing, putting a roof over my head, and, and, and without having to be discriminated against. And I'm a 45-year-old man at, at a time with justification that is highest. Housing is a critical need. Last but not least, I support Senator Neal, and I support this bill. And thank you for joining us and sharing your personal story. Uh, do we have anybody else over the phone wishing to join us in support of Senate Bill 143? Here, you have no more callers in support at this time. We'll go to Las Vegas. Hi, please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is uh, Teresa Armugan, and I was released from prison uh, two weeks ago. Um, I work every day. I was at Casa Grande for a year, so I have a job. I have employment. I work every single day. I have money saved up, and uh, I can't find anywhere to go. I've went to Budget Suites. I've went to Siegel Suites. I've went to Town & Country. I've applied here. I've applied there, and they've all told me... Uh, no, no. Um, I said I'll pay the deposits, whatever. They're not even willing to do that for me. It is uh, scary, and uh, I work every day. And at the end of the day, I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to call home, and it is a nightmare. Like, I'm a single woman, and I'm a mother, and it is a nightmare. I thought getting out of prison would be easy. I have money saved up. Everything is going good, but it's not. So... Uh, I need some help finding housing. That's all there is to it. Um, I am on parole. I've asked my parole officer, and he's just like, this is an issue. And uh, it's just, it's bad. It's, it's bad. Everywhere I go, it's no. So that's all I want to say. And uh, please think about it. Um, I'm the person that picks up your, uh, your tables and shows you your tables, so don't quite give up on me yet, you know. Um, I've done my time, and uh, I'm ready to return to society. All right? Thanks. And thank you, ma'am, for joining us and sharing your personal story. And I don't think anybody's giving up on you. You have a whole host of people presenting a bill specifically for, for your situation, so don't lose hope in, in this building. Um, anybody else wishing to thank testify you. in support of Senate Bill 143? Uh, I see somebody else joining us in Las Vegas, whenever you're ready. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Ashley Gaddish, G-A-D-D-I-S, and I am formerly incarcerated, and I'm here to give my recent personal experience with being an ex-felon and being denied housing, and to note that the problem of discrimination to people with records is alive and current as I speak. Um, just recently, uh, I would say in the past three months, th three to four months, I've been denied housing two times on two different occasions. One was a private owner and one was an apartment complex. And um, 
Uh, I, actually, one, I didn't even get past the background check. It was just a simple question. Did I have a record? Yes. And the, the application didn't go any further. Um, so I am now, I, I was able to find a roommate situation and rent a room. However, on this bill right here, making it, making it unlawful to discriminate against a person with a record is definitely needed here in Nevada and a step in the right direction on many levels. However, um, there is a, some confusion and conflict with the language when, when I reading the bill, specifically in section 34, section one, where it does say that uh, making it unlawful to refuse or rent um, based on a record of any arrest record, conviction record, or record of criminal history, and then going down to section 2A, which was talked about, um, exempting certain offenders of violence and sexual offenses. So that, that's a little confusing and conflicting, and then hearing the bill being proposed and expressed with persons of um, pardons are being expunged. Uh, so I didn't really, I didn't hear anything of people being on probation or parole and having ex existing records because everyone with records, you know, they don't have that expungement or that pardons. So I'm, I'm a little confused with the bill as it's written. And um, I, I hope that this bill is revisited, but as it is right now, um, I'm going, um, I'm in a po opposition of this bill. I just feel on my part, I feel that it's unfair and discriminatory because if a person with a criminal history is making the strides and efforts to put in the work to better their life and they bring the credentials to a, ho a housing situation with their employment, their IDs, clearly that speaks for itself that this person is trying to better their life. And to say, to say the least, like this, this person deserves the opportunity to have a place to call home in pursuant of bettering their house. I mean, in, in pursuant of bettering their lives. Because like it was discussed, it absolutely is um, part of recidivism and homelessness as a result of this um, situation. It's, it's absolutely devastating. Um, I've been, a, I have also gone through that process of getting out and re returning back to prison based on jobs and housing situations. So I've, I'm very much aware of that. And um, I'd also like to um, note that coming out of prison, um, trying to get housing and prepare for your parole board, there's a barrier put up there for people. For example, if I have my family members trying to get housing for me set up and they're asked about, about me and they say, well, she's on parole, she's coming out on parole, do you accept anyone on parole? Almost every management is saying no. So what that does, that keeps the person incarcerated past their parole up to three and four and five months waiting on housing, some approved housing. So there's just a whole ripple effect to this whole situation of discrimination. And Ma'am, thank you for joining us. What, I, what I'm gonna do is yes. just for the sake of clarity, uh, I'm gonna leave your testimony in support, but I'm gonna put the caveat in there that if, because I think it's a, just an interpretation issue versus uh, yes. what the sponsor is doing, uh, but uh, if it's fair for the record, just to be clear, you're in support of the bill if it disallows for discrimination of an individual based on their criminal background check. Uh, and, but if the bill does the opposite or if, if they can't discriminate based on your criminal background, then you would be in opposition. Is Correct. that fair? Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, and I cut you off. I yes. don't know if there was something else you wanted to add.
No, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Is there anybody else in Las you Vegas too. that would like to join us? Um, I see that there's other individuals coming forward. It, feel free to fill up all the seats. So if there's anybody else that wishes to testify in support, you don't have to wait back. You can all come up at the same time. And then we'll just go one, one at a time. Um, so we'll start. I believe I see somebody in red. If you'd like to start off, please. Yes. Yes, my name is Anita Strain. I'm cur currently formerly. formerly incarcerated. Um, I just want to say I have a personal experience. Um, I was in prison a couple months ago, or a couple years ago, and um, my family and friends had um, set it up for me to have an, get an apartment when I got, uh, got out. And um, I was all ready to move in. They were all they were getting ready to move my stuff in. And when it comes to the part where they were paying for it, and then um, the people, the manager has asked where I was at, and my um, my family told them that I was getting out of prison, I'd be on parole. The whole thing was was shut down. I mean, I you know I no longer had a place to go. I had then I had to sit in prison for another extra four to six months, waiting for to be approved from Casa Grande. Went there for four months, got out, didn't have nowhere to go. Went back to what I know, ended up getting locked back up. I've been out since December 20th, and um, it's I can't get I can't get a place anywhere. Um, they do. I, I have a job. I work. I have the means to get a place, but since of, because of my background, nobody's messing with me. It's it's hard. I'm a I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother, but um, you know, it's hard. So I don't I, I don't know what to do. And again, thank you. I went you. to the, all the weeklies. I went to all the weeklies been, and been denied at all the weeklies. All, all the apartment, you know, com, apartment complexes been denied with them. It's there's no one that will approve us. Art, that's all I have to say. And again, thank you for sharing your personal story. I understand that not everybody's always comfortable doing that, and it's difficult to do that. So just thank you. I'm nervous. <laughs> thank you for joining okay. us this evening. Uh, I see somebody in pink. Please join us. Hi, my name is Janice Talavera. Um, I myself also am firmly incarcerated. Um, I just got out about two months ago, and I'm kind of in the same position. I work. I do everything I'm supposed to do. I'm trying to fix my life. And every time I look for a place, I get denied. You know, I had my parents try and be willing to be co-signers, but the fact that it's so expensive, now they don't want to help me. Um, you know, I, I do like the bill and I support it, but I also, you know, also conflicted on the criminal history because with my personal experience and my criminal history, no matter what, I'm always going to get denied. So, you know, I just hope that you guys find a conclusion to where the standard stands with this bill because I need help myself and I want to have somewhere to live to call home and not be homeless or couch surfing or nothing like that. And thank and you for joining us. I have us. to say as well. Thank, thank you for you. joining us this evening. Is there anybody else in Las Vegas? <coughs> Seeing none, at this time I'd like to invite those wishing to speak in opposition of Senate Bill 143. We'll start in Carson City. And if we could please fill up uh, all the seats if we have more than one individual. We have four seats. Please feel free to all come up. Hi, good evening, welcome, whenever you're ready. Uh, good evening, um, Chair Flores and Senate um, Committee members. For the record, my name is Michonne Hurst. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Nevada Rural Housing Authority. And our, uh, the intention of SB 143 aligns directly with our mission um, at the Housing Authority to provide access to affordable housing to Nevadans. However, we're opposing the bill in its current state and stand ready to have conversations um, to discuss our concerns with the sponsor. And it's our belief in with our agency and our experience and expertise that we can help in this process to help come to some resolution that will address both sides of the issue. Um, specifically and briefly, our concerns pertain to Section 341A. As it's written, it is unlawful to inquire into or conduct a background check. However, if Section 342, a person may inquire into or conduct a background check to determine whether a person has convictions of a violent or sexual offense, these two contradict each other. And so we would like some clarity on that language. Uh, Section 345E, uh, the definition of dwelling units, is limited to public housing, units owned by a public housing authority, 
and units that accept vouchers. Um, by limiting the language uh, for dwelling units that are uh, included in this bill to public housing authorities and voucher holders, this contradicts federal requirements and it will hinder voucher holders from accessing housing because landlords will be less likely to want to participate with the program. Section 39 has a different definition of dwelling unit, so we'd like some clarity on that. Um, it's also important to note that the housing authorities already determine eligibility for program participants for public housing and the housing choice voucher. Um, because they're federally regulated programs. Some of the provisions in this bill potentially contradict those federal requirements, and so we would again like to come to the table to bring clarity. So there's um, consensus on both sides because we are federally mandated to adhere to certain guidelines. Um, again, as a public housing agency in Nevada for the past 50 years, the Nevada Rural Housing Authority desires the opportunity to work on SB 143 and its sponsor to help clarify language and identify opportunities and amendments to help remedy any contradictions and to deliver fair and equitable housing opportunities for not Nevadans seeking housing in, housing in any situation. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And I'm sure you, you'll have an opportunity to work with the bill sponsor and hopefully find some common ground. Mr. Sandy, please, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, John Sandy IV with Argentum Partners here today on behalf of the Nevada uh, Part State Department Association. I uh, first want to start out by thanking Senator Neal. Uh, I have much respect for her and her intentions with this bill. Uh, we understand the reasoning and, uh, for the bill, and uh, we... we um, <laughs> emphasize, or I'm just going to, uh, I, we feel for the plight of the, the rehabilitated individuals trying to find appropriate housing in our state. However, we oppose this bill because in our opinion, it upsets the balance of good policy by precluding providers of housing from using background checks for any part of the tenant screening process. Housing providers have legitimate obligations to their tenants to provide a safe and welcoming environment to all residents, male, female, children, the elderly, and background checks are not always a reliable indicator of an individual's chance for success in a community, but they can serve as a piece of information for housing providers to consider in the ultimate decision of welcoming an individual to a housing community. This bill will prevent housing providers from using background checks for any part of the screening process. Unfortunately, the Apartment Association believes this solution only focuses on the needs of the individuals re-entering our society and ignores or diminishes the needs of the housing providers and their residents. The Apartment Association feels that good policy attempts to balance the needs of everyone, and unfortunately, we must oppose this bill. Um, I agree with uh, some of the issues or the, the language and uh, what seem to be some inconsistencies uh, with, that uh, the Nevada Rural Housing Authority uh, provided, and also uh, wanted to address the, uh, the, the issue regarding co-signers there, and the Senator and I did have that conversation at the time. I'm still relatively new to housing, um, and as listening to it, I think maybe perhaps the reason why uh, co-signers uh, have a different screening criteria and require a little bit extra income to qualify as a co-signer is because in most insta instances, that co-signer also has their own housing that they have to pay for, and if they're already paying for their own housing to serve as a guarantor for another's housing, it would seem to make sense that, that the the income requirements for that person to serve in that capacity might be a little bit more. And so I think that's that's probably why that, that occurs. And to, so to limit this bill uh, for a guarantor uh, could be problematic and, and, and make it so difficult for a landlord to qualify anybody as, as a co-signer, which would probably limit uh, the amount of housing that certain applicants would even be qualified for. So I want to uh, just raise that in addition to some of the other concerns. But like I said, I, I mean, respect Senator Neal, understand uh, the, her reasons for this, look forward to working with her, and uh, thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to speak in opposition to Senate Bill 143? Either in Carson City or Las Vegas. I see nobody in Las Vegas. Uh, BPS, do we have anybody joining us over the phone? If you'd like to speak in opposition of SB 143, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. <coughs> Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Uh, at this time, anybody wishing to join us in the neutral position for Senate Bill 143? I see no one in Las Vegas, but we have somebody joining us in Carson City. 
Hi, good evening. Welcome. Hello there. I'm Don Gallimore, uh, Sr. Uh, in this particular one, I'll be representing the Renal Sparks NAACP as the leg legislative chair. And I just got wind of this bill, so uh, this is a very important bill that uh, my uh, cohorts and I have been talking about uh, for pretty much years now also. Um, essentially, uh, we do probably, uh, we accept this bill or we'll, um, we'll um, support this bill, but uh, there are a couple things that we'd like to see probably cleaned up, and that would be uh, just the first one um, that HUD would be, if they're in the first position, um, I'm not sure I understand why the commission doesn't conform to uh, what their policies are. So uh, if this gives the commission, uh, Equal Rights Commission, the authority to have its own uh, authorization or its own power, uh, then I'd like that uh, uh, understood a little bit more. Um, the other thing is that uh, we're looking at um, any court in there. Uh, I forgot the part of, says that the courts can adjudicate over the commission. I'd like to know if any court can uh, make a determination there. Um, also, reentry uh, should mean that all of the inmates who, uh, are eligible after getting off of parole, or off of paper, whatever you want to call it. So that should be uh, something that allows them to be eligible regardless of their background checks. And then fourth one, um, why not include uh, properties under fourplexes? Um, if this is only public housing, then uh, we're, we should probably understand that a little bit more, but uh, I believe that personal or naturalized citizens, as they uh, are referred to here, should be um, under the onus of this bill. And lastly, uh, mandatory deposits over three times the amount uh, should be banned or disallowed. Uh, that's unequal, uh, unequal. So that in um, answer to these ladies, young ladies who have just come up on International Women's Day, I do see that they are requesting help, they're doing the best they can to rehabilita rehabilitate themselves, and I think they should have an opportunity to do so. Thank you, and just for the sake of clarity for the record, uh, because you are in opposition to how the bill is written as it sits now, we're gonna put your testimony in opposition, um, and obviously you have an opportunity to work with the bill sponsor and okay. hopefully find some common ground. Um, with Thanks. that, is there anybody else wishing to testify in the neutral position for Senate Bill 143? Uh, BPS, do we have anybody joining us on the phone? If you would like to testify neutral on SB 143, please press star 9 now. Good evening, this is Tiffany Bank, General Counsel for the Nevada Realtors, testifying in neutral today. We want to thank Senator Neal for continuing to work with us on any concerns we have. In working with Senator Neal, it is our understanding that sections 34 and 41 of this bill do not apply to a single family owner. As defined in this section, a single family owner is a person who owns four or less separate single family units. I know there was a question earlier asking for clarification on the definition of a natural person. And as we discussed with Senator Neal earlier, the intended definition is included in statute and section 40 of this bill and includes corporations, partnerships, and trustees. Thank you again, Senator Neal, for continuing to work with us on this important piece of legislation. And thank you for joining us this evening. BPS, and anyone else wishing to join us in the neutral position for Senate Bill 143? Chair, you have no more callers at this time. Thank you. Senator Neal, any closing remarks? And with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 143. Thank you all for joining us for a very long night. Uh, members, 
before we mo uh, move on to public comment, uh, we do have a committee bill introduction, uh, B uh, BDR 22684, which revises provisions relating to regional planning. As always, I'd like to remind you that uh, allowing for the BDR to move out of committee is only so that it can go to the floor, can be uh, uh, referred to the correct committee, uh, and then we'll have an actual hearing, so it doesn't mean you'll support it. Uh, Senator Goykachi has moved for the bill introduction, uh, for BDR introduction 22684. Vice Chair uh, Orenshaw has seconded that. Members, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, members. And then lastly on the agenda for tonight uh, is public comment. Uh, is anybody here for public comment, either in Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? If you would like to speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hello. So I wanted to uh, come by. This is Mr. Patterson again. Uh, I had thought about uh, a couple of things that uh, one of the centers had said, specifically the one that said, how do we know that when they check the application, if if they're telling the truth? Well, you don't any more than any other citizen. Um, the bottom line is, is that you, it's a process toward being able to reenter society. If society says, well, okay, we want you to take these programs in prison and all these type of things, you get out of prison, you try to join the workforce, you try to be productive and all that. How can you be productive? You don't even have a place to roof the roof over your head. Basic, basic, basic law of uh, survival is to have shelter. We see animals make shelter. So of course a human being should have shelter. And, so and sir, I, I apologize to interrupt. It's very, very important. Sorry, thank you for joining us. However, I just wanted to make it abundantly clear. Uh, the hearing on Senate Bill 143 has been closed, and public comment is okay. not, not utilized as an opportunity to continue that conversation. Um, it's a more of an opportunity for you to discuss okay. general matters that fall within the purview of our committee. So, and I don't mean to interrupt and be rude, but I, okay. uh, just for the sake of fairness and transparency of our committee. But if there's anything else you would like to add okay, I, to I, a regular conversation that falls within the purview of, the com of our committee, this is the time to do so. Well, I appreciate that. I apologize. I meant no uh, offense. Um, I don't know what a regular com conversation is, sir. I thought I was speaking English. But uh, you enjoy the rest of your day. I, I see you had to get somewhere. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you for joining us, sir. Um, with that, uh, we, is there, is there anybody else wishing to join us for public comment? VPS. Yeah, you have no more callers on the line at this time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, members, I appreciate everybody's patience, particularly to our staff. Uh, you are amazing as always. Um, you've earned a Friday off. Please hang out with your families. Give your, yourself an opportunity to relax a little bit. Utilize that time for that. We will be back in this room on Monday at 3.30. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>